we you're here. care for them quite well. Great. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's uh, regular council meeting. At this time, I'll call the meeting to order. I'd like to uh, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I'd like to lead us to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, do I hear an adoption of the agenda? I think you have something to add, Tom? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to move to make, uh, to amend the agenda, please. I would like to add under 11A and re reorder uh, the items under 11, just push them down one, so it would be A, B, C, D, and E. Um, as 11A, um, consideration for action, ordinance number 23-1270, an ordinance of the City of Lake Forest, City Council of the City of Lake Forest Park, Washington, adopting interim development regulations as authorized by the Growth Management Act relating to retaining walls, declaring an emergency, providing for severability, and establishing an effective date. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. It's been moved and second to add ordinance number 23-1270. Yes. Uh, Mr. Mayor, may I also suggest that we move citizens' comment up before presentation? So item seven becomes item six with the indulgence of the council. I would second that. So seven, which that goes before six. Is that what you're saying? Yes. So yes. Swap them. Okay. Okay. Can you summarize it. Or... Go ahead and summarize. Uh, just to, su to summarize, so uh, citizen comments will be coming before the presentations, and then we've added ordinance twenty three twelve seventy two item eleven a and push the others down within that category. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any nays? Okay, pass unanimously. We'll move on. Uh, first up, we have a proclamation. I've asked Councilmember Firatani to read this for me. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's an honor to do this. Uh, whereas on January 1st, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, setting into motion the end of slavery in the United States, and whereas the end of the Civil War began with the surrender of General Lee at Appomattox Courthouse on April 9th, 1865, and ended with the final terms of surrender of the last Confederate general on June 2nd, 1865, and whereas this news reached Texas, where Union Major General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston Bay with his troops, it was on June 19th, 1865, that he announced, the people of Texas are informed that in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free, and whereas celebration of the end of slavery reaching the furthest Union state, which became known as Juneteenth, is one of the oldest public celebrations of the end of slavery in the United States, and whereas Juneteenth celebration spread across many Southern states and more with the movement of freed Texas slaves as they exercise their newfound freedoms in search of family and new lives, and whereas the first Juneteenth celebrations brought friends and families together, often on emancipated land, the first to be owned by former enslaved people and included inspirational speakers reading the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863, food and stories of their of former enslaved people. And whereas Juneteenth commemorates the complete emancipation of Confederate slaves and June 19th was declared Emancipation Day in Texas in 1980. And Whereas on a larger scale, celebration of Juneteenth reminds each of us of the precious promises of freedom, equality, and opportunity, which are at the core of America. Now, therefore, the mayor and the city council of the city of Lake Forest Park do hereby proclaim June 19th as a day to celebrate Juneteenth 2023 in the city of Lake Forest Park, signed this day, eighth day of June 2023, Jeff Johnson, mayor. Thank you, Tracy, very much. Okay, with that, move on to the final confirmation for our newest park and recreation advisory board. Come on up, Corey. Will you introduce our guests this evening and then I'll let the council go at them. Yeah, uh, so I have Steve here. Uh, Mary and I interviewed him a couple of weeks ago now, but we thought he'd be a great fit and I'll let him introduce and talk about the background. Hi, Steve Feth. I uh, moved to the area about three years ago with my family during COVID. Um, we were in West Seattle, love West Seattle for all its great parks. We moved here. We really appreciated the, the community. 
we think outdoor spaces are really important to community and mental health. I built my career on it, uh, 23 years at REI. Um, we've really been attracted to this, this area, the size of it, um, the wonderful parks, the feeling of access and safety has just been such a special moment looking for ways just to volunteer and thank you the public for showing up for me that I'm really <laughs> <laughs> you all um, so it's sort of it in a nutshell council any questions yes council member Riddle. so in your three years here what is your favorite park so I, I'm going to answer that sort of my politician answer would be we do a loop so we come we're at the top of the hill here and we come down to animal acres we go through whispering willows we go through blue hair and then we come up the hill and just do a loop so um i would say that loop is our favorite but we live close to grace cole thank you questions yes council member Fertine. thank you mr mayor and thank you mr fess for uh your stepping up and uh we really appreciate citizen volunteers like you really really keeps the city moving and <laughs> pun intended um the uh question i have for you is about um you know your uh kind of interests uh i've read your statement and you've got you know a lot of uh, interesting ideas is there any among them that you want to pick and to kind of highlight you know what, what, what's what's your interest in being on the parks board i think the exciting new park going in across the, the the street here um really interested me in this i was debating between like tree board and this it's it seems like a really exciting um opportunity for transformational change here so i think that that's what's really like giving me the energy councilmember Bodie. Hello, Steve, Mr. Feth. Thank you so much for stepping up. I'm the council's liaison to the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board. Um, so I'll be seeing a lot of you uh, at least once a month and maybe more as the lakefront property discussions go forward. Um, one question I, I uh, or one point I wanted to address and get your thoughts on is as a tr as a member of the Parks and Recreation um, Advisory Board, you're both representing the community and giving the city input, but you're also kind of reaching out to the community, especially during the park planning process. So do you have any thoughts on or any comments on that wearing two hats and uh, uh, how you think that will be going in the in the year ahead? Well, I, yeah, I think this is for the people, right? So I do think I believe in sort of like vision strategy, um, planning, execution, and feedback. So I think like that vision needs to sort of be reconciled with the um, you know the community, right? Mm -hmm. And the community's voice needs to be part of it because it is their park. Mm -hmm. So are you are you comfortable reaching out to the community, doing some outreach and engagement with the community yourself as a as a board member? Door to door. <laughs> no, not exactly. <laughs> yes, I am. At least among your acquaintances. Yes, uh, totally. or and answering of, questions if your neighbors ask you. And yeah, part of this is building my community too. So we have this mm -hmm. deep rooted West Seattle community and trying to build here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, Councilmember Cassover, then Councilmember Goldman. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much, Mr. Feth, for stepping up here. Um, it it's hugely important for the community that we have folks who volunteer, and um, I'm really impressed with your background. One of the things that actually catches my eye. Uh, 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 in your um, CV is the fact that you have tremendous amount of budgeting experience, and uh, budgeting oh, and yes. uh, finance and, you know, project planning kind of things. And um, I wondered if you will, will be interested in how you see the finances of this park working out over time. And if you if you this is of interest to you and you want to participate in thinking that through and helping make that happen yes i've been on two other boards um nonprofit boards both of which on finance committees so um or sorry one board but one finance committee on another board so it is my area of interest it's very good i i applaud that thank you very much <laughs> councilman goldman Yes, um, and thank you for being willing to volunteer. Uh, you mentioned the Lakefront Park. I'm also excited about that. Do you have any sort of initial thoughts about what you would like to see the Lakefront Park become? I really don't. Um, I think that it is, like like I said before, access is, is I think, really is important for the you know community. How, how are we going to ensure access um, would be kind of, it's going to be for all. So I think that's important. But um, beyond that, I, I haven't really looked into much beyond like understanding about it. 
Yep. Thank you. And also, if I could have an indulgence um, for those curious about why I'm dressed <laughs> like this, um, this afternoon was my was the chemistry department's graduation ceremony, and I, I came straight from that. Mm -hmm. I assumed it had something to do with. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Sorry, Larry. I thought we didn't get the memo about dress up. Today. <laughs> <laughs> it's medieval costume night yeah. for the council. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Steve, uh, for being willing to volunteer. And I love the fact that you have a loop that you walk around through <laughs> through the parks. And you probably can see that with limited resources, we have um, we have some challenges ahead of us, as well as making sure that um, the the new properties that we've acquired uh, because we've acquired close to nine acres over the last few years um, that those properties are developed and then maintained properly. Do you have any thoughts about, about encouraging the community to support that kind of activity? <laughs> I told my wife once that everyone should uh, volunteer to pull 100 square feet of ivy every year. There you go. <laughs> if the math works out good at all. <laughs> but I do think, um, I don't have good ideas around community outreach at this point, but I do think it's important for you know, uh, the engagement to to maintain these parks. And we do get it by Grace Cole Park. We get the volunteers to clean up there. It's pretty effective there. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your willingness to serve. And, and if there are no other comments, I'd like to go ahead and move final confirmation of uh, Steve's staff. Second. It's been moved and second. Anybody, any other conversation? Seeing none, all those in favor of Steve Feth on the uh, Parks Board? Please say aye. 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 Any nays? Pass unanimously. The Parks Board probably needs to figure out where that new REI sponsored climbing mall is going to be. <laughs> it's all a hidden agenda. <laughs> Thank, Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. All right. It looks now we are going to citizens' comments. We do not have a police chief. So if somebody, Corey, can you bring up the list? Yeah. Big hand for Corey. Thank you, Corey. Okay. First up, I always can't read anybody. Oh, Kathy. Right? Kathy Como. Hey, I wasn't the only yeah, one struggling. Kathy, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, Come on. Uh, <laughs> Hi, Kathy. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was like, maybe it's just me. I'm, I'm going to wear my glasses and fill it out with you. My glasses with I can't watch. Yeah. Um, thank you. And I have been watching this process a little bit. I have not been investing as much time as you guys have nearly in this wall, tree, community, cement. Uh, et cetera, stuff. But from the little I see, it's a big issue. And I think it's bigger than um, we have any idea, right? And I don't know that. That's my guess. Um, I was up in the park today, Horizon View Park. It's gone. And um, I mentioned to one woman, well, you've heard about the trees. And she said, what are you talking about? That? And she was, no. So we've got a lot of people who don't still don't know. Um, Roger Miller, who is the secretary of WSDOT, has said that he wants complete streets beyond the curb. He wants more pavement, not he wants, sorry. Um, he wants it for all users, pedestrians, bicyclists, bicyclists, and public transport. Um, he wants the emphasis on the bikes and the peds over the cement, et cetera. Um, he wants to use a multimodal approach. So I wrote to him. I don't know if he'll ever get it or if he'll be interested, but I asked for a multimodal approach here because we are struggling. Um, I, I, I am aware of many people who are upset. Maybe it's just where I'm looking. Um, I'd like to take us back for just a second to 200, 2004, where we wrote this, some of you, well, none of you were on it, but 
um, the goals and policies of the community forest management plan for Lake Forest Park. A goal, number one, preserve, restore, maintain, enhance, and a vibrant, healthy, and diverse community forest within Lake Forest Park, consisting of both native and non-native landscape. And then there are policies, A, B, C, D, E, F for that goal too. Create a community forest management program or plan that is easily understood. It has community support and has clearly defined parameters for application and enforcement and is attainable, educates our citizens and promotes pride in our trees. You at Tree City USA and our city community wildlife habitats. Uh, number three, goal three, recognize and address humans and property safety concerns in the community forest program. Goal four, preserve, restore, maintain, enhance tree canopy in developmental areas. Uh, goal five, preserve, restore, maintain, enhance tree canopy in new development plans by implementing the community forest management project. So what if, the transit is only going to take out, only going to take out 380 trees. What will that do to our canopy caused by the trees? What will that do? We know the surrounding communities depend on our tree canopy. I don't know. I don't know. So please, um, I'd, I'd like to see a little bit more on that. Thank you. Um, I think my time's up, is yeah, it? Thank you very much. So thank you very much. I'm sorry, I was a little nervous, but Thank you for listening to your Thanks, Kathy. You did good, Kathy. Okay, all are good. Oh, you. Hello there. This is a lot better than the other one. I like this a lot better. I really like the examples uh, C, D, E, and F. I'm not so crazy about the design part, you know, where you're showing dead trees, where you're putting, where you're taking live trees. But I do, this is so much better. And then I wanted to comment on the tree permitting. And I and I really hope that we don't bundle the, all of those tree permits as a single one. I think that we really need to account for a tree, for a tree, for a tree, and not have to replant them somewhere else in some bank somewhere where we don't know where they are. And then uh, I also wanted to thank the planning department for the wonderful write-up they did on my permit for the borings. It was a very good job that Nick and planning department did. It uh, resulted in a kind of a smackdown for sound transit because they hadn't done their due diligence. So I wanted to thank them. That's all. Thanks thank you very much. Uh, Vicki Scurry. Hi there. I want to talk a little bit about landscape and aesthetics tonight. Um, I'm concerned about the slots because I just spent the whole day doing drip irrigation in my yard just to keep it alive these days, how the weather, how the weather really is in Seattle in the summer, where you can go 51 days or longer without any rain or drizzle or anything. I do not believe the 6 inch or 12 inch by 8 inch with two 6 inch diameter pipes um, reaching into the earth are going to be satisfactory for growing um, much of anything. I worked on the project for Shoreline where we did the um, gateway over at 155th, I think, and 161st. It took the Boston Ivy on that project about 10 years to actually start really covering the wall, and it started with three years of drip irrigation. Um, it now really does cover the wall. The other caution I have is about putting the trees back like this, which Paula described them as dead trees. I think that some people are gonna have a really adverse reaction to this in place of what we actually have, which is a substantial tree canopy that's green and lush and changes with the seasons. This is dead by comparison. If you put this up with dead vines or vines that are barely thriving, it's gonna be a big insult to the community and it's gonna be in their face every day. So I think this wall thing is bigger than, it's bigger than just aesthetics. It's the psychology of our space that's being affected. And it's who we are that's being affected. So I caution you to use a lot of, I would say, 
judgment and expertise, talking with people who actually are in the business who know this type of work. The other thing I would say about these green walls that are in here, they may apply somewhere, but they're usually not used on highway projects, the ones that you're showing. These you see in developments where they can do intensive irrigation and they have maintenance, mostly on highway projects. If you have a green wall, it's going to be an MSE green wall. It's going to be a standard wall construction project, you know, and those you, if you irrigate them for three years, they'll, you know, they will survive. They'll look like shredded wheat in the winter because basically everything goes brown, but it's more, you should have something like that in here too for an actual highway project. Um, how many minutes I have one minute yet left. So I really appreciate you're doing the wall ordinance. I'll say that much. I appreciate you're considering noise, but I think it should be a separate ordinance at this point because it's a very complicated problem. And I wish we had taken this up a year ago when I first kind of sent around the noise report to everybody and said, you know, this is flawed. Um, what are we going to do about it? Because normally walls and sound walls go together. And the, the way you construct the wall, like canting it back, would be part of the issue here, you know, because that would help lift the sound instead of directing it across the street. All those things are considerations that if we'd had more conversation about this sooner, we could have addressed it. So I appreciate your addressing it now. I hope that we get a good project out of this because otherwise we're going to live with it for the next hundred years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dick Harris. Dick Harris. Dick Harris again. Uh, thanks for your work. I appreciate your work on the wall ordinance. Um, I, <laughs> I, I need to become a pain on an issue that I have, and that's with the lighting. Uh, as I've said in here before, there is no planned lighting on that on our section of 522 and Bothell Way whatsoever. I cannot find, well, I can't actually find another major thoroughfare with no sidewalk like ours has. All, our, all ours has is a side of the road. There is no sidewalk whatsoever. Now, ST is going to put a sidewalk there. There is no lighting planned whatsoever for the sidewalk or the street in that entire section, except for intersections. Now, it's unconscionable that that's the case. And I would think that the city planners would be involved in this and actually figure out how to what we should be demanding from Sound Transit. I, I don't know if the owners are going to have to uh, come together and push back against Sound Transit on this to get them to step up. The only thing I have in writing is that there is no lighting <laughs> except for intersections and where there's lighting now. But that actually is not on their plan either. That's not on their plan. I don't find anywhere in the city that anybody in the city has ever talked about lighting whatsoever. Okay, bothers me. We need to do something about it. It's not acceptable. There's no other major thoroughfare in the greater Seattle area that has no lighting. You go to Kenmore, you go to Bothell, you go to Linwood, you go to Aurora, all the new highways in the last actually 22 years all have lighting. Oh, guess what? This is not, it's not acceptable. So if the owners have to push back, that's fine. But, but what we wanna know is the city behind us they see behind us if we do. Of course, we, unlike the city, have threat of eminent domain and the bureaucracy kicking the heck out of us, you know, for stepping up and, and trying to get them to do something. We need the city behind us somehow. Somebody needs to do something. I know you've had stuff in writing on that, at least one, on the safety and criminal aspect of it and what have you, dark streets, no eyes on the street, and what have you. The police need to be able to see too, you know? We've had probably a dozen criminal vandalism and break-ins of our houses and what have you over the last 10, 12 years, 15 years. So we've been here 43 years. I think this is the city's job to help us. You're the stewards of this. You're the ones that are in control. We feel not, not very much in control, quite frankly. So we need your support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeff Snedden. Hmm. 
Well, it's me again. Um, and I want to start off by saying from the bottom of my heart and the Corps' heart and the citizens of Lake Forest Park, a huge thank you to Steve Bennett and Nick Holland in particular. Fantastic job. Thank you very much, Steve. Job well done. Um, uh, with regard to Sound Transit's um, request for a critical area uh, permit. Um, I had a bunch of things I was going to go over. I'm just going to go over a few things. Um, you, you discover things along the way <clears throat> as you really dig into Sound Transit. I found this one just a couple of days ago. This is a uh, page from a presentation made to the very last mayor's elected leadership committee that uh, is part of Sound Transit's organization. The last time they met was February 22nd of 2019. Right here, it says transit, sorry, transit, um, uh, a Q jump signal can save 10 to 30 seconds for every stoplight. We have four stoplights. So that's somewhere between 40 and two minutes. Uh, Sound Transit says by building this dedicated eastbound bus lane, we'll save 2.3 minutes. So those stoplights just alone, let alone with having smaller Q pass uh, areas around where the bus stops are, is all we need to probably at least deliver 2.3 minutes, if not more. It's the same design that's on 145th Street. There are no dedicated bus lanes there. There are, uh, there are signalized lights and there are longer stretches uh, that, where a bus can pull off to a bus stop. 60, no, here's the other thing. I got this through a public records request. It tells you how much time is saved intersection by intersection. 62% of the 15.7 minutes that's saved in this entire route is saved on 145th Street. And I, I, I can't understand for the life of me how this can't be made an issue and can't be brought to the attention and care of the board of directors of Sound Transit. The damage to this community, we all know about it. It's significant, it's multi-generational, it touches businesses, it touches homeowners, it touches the economy of our city. Um, business issues, uh, we've been talking to uh, small business owners, they're, they're terrified about what's going to happen. And yet, there's what we're being told is, it's a done deal. You can't change their minds. Their mind is made up because you voted for it. Well, we voted for something in 2016, but it wasn't explicit that we were going to get this 2.3 mile or 1.2 mile dedicated bus lane. So I'm, I'm working very hard, trying very hard. The only thing that we can do is to raise the awareness of people in Lake Forest Park, which know virtually nothing about what this design really is and what the consequences are, and to mobilize them and make our collective voices known force, forcefully. And when I say forcefully, I mean with a large number of people that show up at a Sound Transit board meeting. That's about all I can come up with as a way to gain attention. Anything you could do to help would be greatly appreciated. I think the wall ordinance is great, and I would please ask you not to mix it with noise because that just opens a can of worms, and I don't know that we'd ever get anything done. So that's all I have to say. Oh, yeah, one I'm other thing real that. quick. Real quickly, the SEPA that came out, and, and we had six weeks to comment on it. Uh, this is this is a thousand pages. It was 2,700 pages long. So we had six weeks to comment on it or anybody who was interested in it. So that's my problem. Okay, um, anybody else here would like to speak? Okay, anybody online? I see we have a couple visiting. If you wanna address the council, please use the raise hand function. Doesn't look like it, Mr. Mayor. Okay, so at this time we'll close citizens' comments. Thank you. Um, if anybody would like to leave before we get into our presentations, you're more than welcome. But we have some really exciting presentations coming up, actually. So, so we'll start with those. Our first one is our legislative end of season session report. Shelly Helder, welcome. Let's just get over with. All of them want to know how the families do. 
<laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council. Good to be with you tonight. Um, I am Shelly Helder, and I have the privilege of representing the City of Lake Forest Park as your government affairs consultant or your state lobbyist, basically your voice in Olympia. So um, before I get started this evening, I just want to note that there is a comprehensive written report um, in your council packet, and that's going to go into much more detail than I'll be able to cover during this presentation. So this evening, I'm going to provide an overview of the 2023 state legislative session. I'm going to review the outcomes of the city's legislative priorities. Um, I'll highlight a few additional issues that impact city governments, and we'll wrap up by talking about next steps. So the 2023 session was the first time the legislature has conducted their work in person in over two years. The public was still able to participate virtually through remote testimony, uh, but all legislators were present in Olympia. It was the first year of the biennium and it was a long 105 consecutive days. The primary objective of the long session was to adopt new biennial budgets, which the legislature did. In addition to adopting their budgets, they also um, passed or considered over 2,100 bills and ultimately passed 485. And because this was the first year of the biennium, every bill that did not pass this year is automatically reintroduced next year. Democrats held strong majorities in both chambers, and as a result of the last election cycle, there were over 20 new uh, members of the legislature which meant that there were new committee assignments, new committee chairs, new um, legislators in positions of caucus leadership, and all of that impacted what happened this session. So I mentioned the primary objective is to adopt um, the budgets, and the state has three budgets. The operating budget funds all state agencies. It's the largest and um, it's the largest budget, and primarily more than 50% of the budget goes towards the K through 12 education system. The 23-25 state operating budget is $69.8 billion. Some noteworthy allocations um, for cities include 20 million for grants to local governments, to um, assist with updating and imp implementing comprehensive plans and development regulations, 150 million to transition individuals living in encampments to housing, um, over 250 million for various behavioral health services. The capital budget funds public and nonprofit construction projects that are non-transportation related. It's a $9 billion budget, and it's primarily funded through the sale of bonds. There's roughly 95 million remaining in bond capacity for a supplemental budget next year. The capital budget makes major investments in housing, behavioral health, and education. The state's third and final budget is transportation. It's $13.5 billion, and it's the first biennium that um, the state is implementing the Move Ahead Washington package, uh, which was adopted by the legislature last year. Revenues that fund the state's transportation budget, which are primarily gas tax revenues, are continuing to decline. Um, heading into this legislative session, um, many communities were concerned because the governor's proposed transportation budget pushed out projects up sometimes more than a decade into the future. Um, and so that was concerning to many, many communities. Um, for the most part, the legislature was able to honor its previous commitments for many of those projects um, and laid out a phasing of projects for the next six years so that there's predictability for planning purposes. This was also the first budget that incorporated Climate Commitment Act revenues, um, which are scattered throughout all three budgets, um, but are restricted to being spent on carbon reducing programs and projects. So moving on to discuss the outcome of the city's top priorities, the city identified four priorities for the 23 session. The first priority was a capital budget request for replacement of the city owned culvert on Lion Creek near State Route 104. The original estimated cost um, was 2.42 million, but through some project scope adjustments, the cost was lowered to 1.77 million and that became our request of the state. For some context, the capital budget includes a grant program to fund locally owned culverts. It's referred to as the Brian Abbott Fish Barrier Removal Board. 
It's a competitive grant program that's administered by the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Project sponsors, so in this case, the city, um, submit applications and are ranked by DFW. The legislature then determines how far down that recommended list that they're able to fund. The legislature has never fully funded that list. Um, and more often than not, they're barely able to reach a quarter of the projects on that list. However, capital budget writers, um, particularly in the House, are reluctant to fund projects outside of that grant program. It's viewed somewhat as cutting in line. Um, so the city has applied to that grant program in the past, but each time we are ranked low on the list and have never successfully received a grant through that program. Um, the alternative to receiving funding from the state um, outside of the Fish Barrier Removal Board is through um, your local legislators uh, to request funds through what's called the Local Community Project or LCP. And the LCP is essentially the state's version of earmarks. Um, the average award for an LCP is $700,000, and that's when it's a budget year, which is what this year was. Um, generally, budget writers try to spread that across um, each legislative district, meaning that there's um, not necessarily 700,000 that goes towards each project. It may be less based on the district that you're in. To be considered for this funding, you have to have a legislative sponsor. Um, after seeing the Lake Forest Park culvert firsthand last year, when our um, first district legislators came out and we took them on a tour of the site, they were committed to sponsoring this as a project. Um, and and said, doesn't matter if it's not on the recommended list, we want to we want to see this project get completed. Um, so Senator Stanford, Representative Dewar, and Representative Kloba sponsored um, our our capital budget request. Um, we developed the supporting materials to tell the story of the work that the city has done to date um, and the importance of doing this project now in coordination um, with the state-owned culvert upstream. So when the House proposed capital budget came out, we were not included, which was not too surprising considering um, what we know about the House capital budget writers. Um, we were, however, um, fully funded in the Senate proposed budget along with the 3% administrative fee that's charged by the Department of Commerce. Um, and so in the final weeks of session, as the House and the Senate are negotiating the differences between those two versions of the budgets, Representative Dewar and Representative Kloba really went to bat for us to make sure that that funding was included in the final budget, which it was. So the end result is that Lake Forest Park is receiving 1.82 million, less the 3% administrative fee um, towards the culvert along State Route 104. Can I say one thing real quick? Um, we've been trying to get that. If I add up right, we finally just paid for that culvert. That is an amazing thing. We've been trying 12 years and thank you very much. You've, you've talked about this every year for 12 years and we went and we've been up and like she said, sometimes we never, but that 1.82 makes me about the happiest guy I ever see. I don't know if we, I'll be alive when they actually do the project, <laughs> but thank you very much because you really have really helped us out. And I'm just thrilled to say that we've got it paid for finally. So yes, thank you yes. Much. Well, the credit definitely goes to our first district legislators. So I, I will cover that in a moment. Um, the city's second priority was a threefold request for investments along State Route 104. We asked for $900,000 to complete the funding gap for the SR 104 roundabout. Um, Senator Stanford and Representative Dewar sponsored our request. We, we were told early on by transportation budget writers that there was no there wasn't going to be new revenue for new projects. Um, and when the budget proposals were released, there was no funding for the roundabout. Um, and we followed up, tried to get into it, into the budget through amendments. Um, and it was, there was no path forward this session. We also asked for uh, bicycle pedestrian infrastructure to improve the non-motorized access to transit along SR 104. Um, the transportation budget allocates 51.9 million towards uh, WashDOT pedestrian bicycle safety program, which administers competitive grants to local governments. Um, once there's a specific project identified, um, there is grant opportunities to pursue. Um, funneling money through grant programs is becoming increasingly common, both for the transportation and uh, capital budgets. 
Finally, we asked the state to prioritize the maintenance of SR 104. And while the legislature does not typically direct WashDOT to, to maintain specific highways, they do control the purse strings on how much um, money is available for maintenance and preservation. In the 23-25 um, transportation budget, there's 610 million for highway maintenance and 834 million for state highway preservation. So now that WashDOT knows what their budget is for maintenance and preservation, they'll be making and updating their plans accordingly. And so it is really the prudent time to reach out to the regional administrator and ask and urge them to um, include SR 104 in their plans for this biennium. And that's something that I'm happy to help facilitate. And um, if necessary, I know our state legislators would want to engage as well. The third priority um, focused on broad city financial challenges and the unsustainable fiscal structure that cities are bound to because of the limit on property tax growth. We supported three different bills introduced this session that would have lifted the cap to 3%. Um, none of them advanced. One was voted out of committee. Um, there was a surge of excitement about another bill in the final weeks of session, um, but ultimately this remains a really challenging topic in Olympia. The final priority was support for the standup of the Crisis Receiving Center in North King County. This was a priority that was shared by the cities of Kirkland, Shoreline, Kenmore, and Bothell. And this project has been in the making for years. Um, we weren't sure if there was going to be sufficient grant funding available when you all adopted your legislative agenda. Um, but leading up to and throughout the legislative session, I uh, coordinated with the government affairs team for Connections Health Solutions, as well as the lobbyists for the other cities to make sure that we were all speaking with one voice. Ultimately, the project was fully funded through grant funding. Um, and this session, really the focus was on uh, passing Senate Bill 5120, which creates a licensing pathway for 23 hour crisis receiving centers like the one that will be here in North King County. Really the credit for the success of this priority is owed to city staff um, here in Lake Forest Park, as well as the other cities that have really brought this project from vision to pending reality. So in addition to the city's top priorities, there were dozens of other policies that um, impact city government. And I'm gonna hopefully briefly review highlights from three categories. Uh, the first category, is um, other legislative priorities, which are identified on the city's legislative agenda. Um, as a city, we supported the expansion of city tools and resources, specifically requesting full funding for the Public Works Trust Fund and new revenue options for cities. The legislature allocated 400 million towards the Public Works Assistance Account, uh, which provides low interest loans to local governments for infrastructure projects. In addition to the influx of funding into that account, um, payments from previous loans um, are were previously being redirected into other accounts. Those diversions are going to end and the payments will be going back into the assistance account, meaning there'll be more funding available moving forward. Um, the primary new revenue option that was considered for cities this session was House Bill 1628. It would have allowed cities to implement a third quarter real estate excise tax, and it would have been devoted to affordable housing. Um, the bill did not advance this session, and while it will technically be reintroduced next session, um, it's not common for new revenue to be considered in um, an election year. We also supported legislation that diverts products from the waste stream. So House Bill 1131, which was referred to as the Washington Recycling and Package Act, would have created a paper product and packaging stewardship program. Say that 10 times fast. Um, and the bill did not pass this year, but this is, this is a, a major policy shift and um, policies of this nature usually do take several years to advance. This was the second year it had been considered. There was significant progress made. I have no doubt it will return next year. Um, Senate Bill 5144, sponsored by our own Senator Derek Stanford, um, did pass the legislature and it creates a battery stewardship program that's overseen by the Department of Ecology, um, but paid for and um, essentially managed by the producers of batteries. So um, in a few years, there will be battery recycling um, collection sites throughout the community. 
The second category is housing, which was a top priority for the legislature this session. There were hundreds of bills introduced on this topic. Um, a few noteworthy bills that passed include condominium liability reform, um, providing a SEPA exemption for infill development that's consistent with the city's comp plan, um, providing cities with resources to improve permit processing, and perhaps the most discussed and longest coming uh, bill was on middle housing. The momentum for the middle housing bill um, has been building for years, and uh, the legislature was really motivated to uh, reduce construction costs for housing. Since one of the major cost drivers for new homes is the price of land, the idea behind building more units on the same footprint is really what motivated this policy. There were easily 10 dozen different versions of this bill over the years, so it can be a little difficult to keep track of what actually passed. Um, but I'll start off by saying what the bill doesn't do. It does not allow for sky rise development in single family neighborhoods, and it does not ban the construction of single family homes. It does establish a minimum number of units that must be authorized on all lots zoned primarily residential. So for cities below 25,000 in population, um, the city must allow at least two units on all lots. An accessory dwelling unit is considered one unit, which means that if a city already allows an ADU on all lots, then they're already in compliance with that portion of the bill. The, the version of the bill that passed the legislature was a compromise, both on the part of housing advocates who wanted to see much greater density authorized on all lots, um, and on the part of local governments who didn't want any, um, didn't want the state telling them what to do with their local zoning and land use. Um, but ultimately it passed because there, it, it was a compromise. Um, and that was really a big theme of legislation this session. In the final category of public safety, there were two primary policies discussed. The first was police vehicular pursuits. Um, as you all know, in 2021, the legislature passed a law requiring probable cause rather than reasonable suspicion to believe that the person in the vehicle has committed certain offenses before an officer could engage in a vehicular pursuit. The higher threshold has caused concern among many law enforcement agencies as they've experienced more people eluding or, or trying to get away from the police. Advocates of the reform were concerned that reverting back to reasonable suspicion would result in more dangerous pursuits. Um, ultimately, after some unique legislative uh, maneuvers, Senate Bill 5352 passed the legislature. It lowers the evidentiary threshold for vehicular pursuits to reasonable suspicion for specific crimes. Um, notably, those crimes do not include property crimes. That was a, a really important sticking point for some legislators who wanted to see property crimes included, wanted to see it go further. Um, for others, the bill was a reversal of the progress that was made in the 2021 session. But similar to housing, the bill passed because it had enough support from legislators who saw this as, as progress, but perhaps not perfect. Um, the second topic in the public safety arena is um, the reason the legislature was called back to Olympia for a special session. The state's previous law on possession of controlled substances was set to expire um, June 30th of this year. That law was uh, intentionally established to be temporary um, following the Supreme Court's ruling in 2021 that drug possession was not a felony. Senate Bill 5536 initially passed the Senate with a bipartisan mix of votes and established uh, possession as a gross misdemeanor. The House amended the bill substantially um, and um, amongst many of the changes established possession as a misdemeanor. Because the bill passed both chambers in different forms, it didn't pass the legislature. A compromise bill was brought forward on the final day of session. It did not have the votes to pass and it's the first time in many years that a bill was bought, brought to the House floor and failed. So the regular session ended with no solution. Um, the governor called for a special session to begin on May 16th. Um, legislators worked for several weeks up until that day to um, reach an agreement that was um, in all four corners were in agreement on the version that was brought forward. Um, that compromise establishes knowing possession as a gross misdemeanor 
and establishes public use as a gross misdemeanor. Both are subject to a maximum of 180 days in jail and a $1,000 fine for the first two offenses. If there's a third offense, the maximum number of days in jail is raised to 364, which is the typical limit for gross misdemeanors. Um, after many impassioned floor speeches for and against the merits of the bill, um, it passed the legislature and was signed by the governor the same day. So that was a lot of information. <laughs> um, now that the session is over, what comes next? Well, um, I think Mary Johnson spoke to it a little bit earlier, but um, really the first thing that I would encourage the city to do is to thank your state legislators for um, not only representing the city's interests, which they definitely did, um, but also just recognizing the sacrifice that it takes to be um, in public office, which you all know, and I think um, elected to elected, that goes a long way. Um, with all the bills the legislature passed, there's a lot of work to do. <laughs> Uh, so city staff are going to have their plates full, um, not only with um, completing the projects that we received funding for, but also implementing all the new policies. Um, somewhat related to that, I mentioned earlier in the presentation, the state is more and more moving towards funneling money through grant programs. And so um, it's, it's really important that when those grant opportunities open, that we pursue them. And it, it can be very time consuming. Um, and often, even if we aren't successful in securing the grant funding, that makes us more competitive when we then go for the earmark process. So that's something I would really encourage um, the city to continue to work on. And then lastly, it is never too early to begin preparing for the next legislative session. Um, really our success in the legislative session is because of the work that we do over the interim months. And so um, between now and when the 2024 session starts in January, um, I'll be working with city staff and with you all to make sure that we're prepared for that date. So I'm done. Happy to answer any questions. Yes, Council Member for time. Hi, and thanks, Ms. Elder, for a great report. Um, it was a lot of information, but you really managed to put it in there. Um, so one question I have is you mentioned that the state is moving more towards a grant funding model as opposed to just outright, um, you know, allocating money. Um, a lot of cities our size don't have the capacity uh, for staff to actually administer, let alone write up all these grants. Are there any um, rumblings in Olympia about building in uh, capacity into these grant proposals? In other words, being able to hire staff to be project managers and things like that. That's a great question. And it's actually something that I've raised when I've talked to both capital and transportation leads. Um, it, pointing out that the expectation for cities to pursue these grants, it's its great in theory because it means that you get the, the best and the most worthy projects, but in reality, it means you end up with projects in the communities that have the most resources to pursue the grant opportunities. Um, and so I know at least in the transportation uh, budget, there is um, a plan to provide resources to ensure communities that don't otherwise have staffing um, will still be able to com compete for that grant. Um, I don't know about the capital budget, but I know it's something that capital budget writers have have thought about. Maybe if they haven't committed to it yet, um, at least it's a consideration. Thanks. Council Member Cassover and then Deputy Mayor French. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And thank you so much, Shelley, for um, a great report. Um, in a recent Seashore Transportation uh, Commission meeting, we had representatives of the Washington State Department of Transportation there, and they expressed real uh, disappointment in the transportation budget this year, saying that, in fact, they uh, only got 40% of what they asked for for highway maintenance and um, improvements. And this is the reason why we've seen such um, degradation of the quality of uh, 104 and um, they didn't give us very much hope about how soon they would do anything very significant on improving Highway 104 and um, there they are in fact right now doing a sort of crack and seal kind of um, pretty low level maintenance at the moment I'd say having driven through it a couple of times this week um, and so I just wanted you to know that because um, 
it's something that we need to make sure our legislators are really well aware of. And uh, those of us who manage city budgets know full well that um, the longer you leave it, the more expensive it gets. And I just sometimes worry that the legislators don't understand that. And I, I just, what do you think? <laughs> well, it's a point well made because, um, correct, um, the transportation budget does not fund maintenance and preservation at the level that WashDOT um, indicated is necessary. And um, I, I'm not legislator, so I don't know what the rationale was there. I think part of the challenge is that there's a there's always a demand for new projects. Maintaining what we have is not as appealing as building something new. And so I think you're right. Um, continuing to tell our legislators that what we want money for is maintenance and preservation, then empowers them to take votes and to and to make investments that prioritize what we're asking them to. Um, I think the other thing that I would say to that is, while it may not be the level that WashDOT requested, it is a significant amount. Um, and, and so there, there are resources there. I guess I just don't want us to take no for an answer prematurely. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mayor French. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. And let me start off by saying, Shelly, thank you so much for your efforts on our behalf. This session, for some reason, just seemed immensely stressful and, and busy. And I, I, know, I know I'm understating the point. Um, on the topic of the Public Works Trust Fund, um, the music to our ears to hear that they're actually going to put the money back. Do you think this is the end of them raiding the Public Works <laughs> Trust Fund? That's <laughs> funny. <laughs> or at least temporarily. So I think the raids on the trust fund will return once state revenues begin to decline. There was a bill that was introduced this session sponsored by Senator Mark Mullet that would have created an account in the state treasury and essentially protected the Public Works Trust Fund from being raided in the future. It would have required an amendment to the Constitution and therefore a vote of the people. Um, and basically, the legislature decided that that was going to be too hard of a path forward, and so they weren't going to bother with passing the bill. Um, but that's the reason that it's going to be constantly at risk is because it's not technically protected. Um, I do think it's at risk in the future when the the state is looking to fund projects and they see that account and it's plump and they want to take it. Yeah, it seems as though with it seems to ebb and flow with the economy. They go after it when the economy is down and, and they're happy to let it grow when it's when it's not. And the for the edification of the community, that tr that trust fund is essential, particularly uh, for smaller, you know, jurisdictions um, and districts as well. You know, local utility districts depend on those funds to find low interest fund financing. And, and um, it's there's very few sources for capital projects and with infrastructure crumbling all around the country. And we see it uh, everywhere as you walk around. Um, I was really hoping I'd heard rumors about that protection uh, bill for the trust fund. And I, I didn't know the outcome of it. Well, thank you for all you have done for us. Um, I, in my mind, echoing the mayor's statements, uh, sentiments, I think this was a hugely successful legislative session for this city. So thank you for your efforts. Anything else? Oh, yes, Councilmember Goldman. Yes, um, thanks for your report. Um, looking ahead to the future in the 24 session, if you were to break out your crystal ball, what are some of the core topics you think the legislature will be considering next year? That's a good question. Um, it is going to be a short session, so it's only 60 days and it's a supplemental budget. As I mentioned, there's limited, going to be limited uh, budget capacity in the capital. Don't expect there to be anything much new funded in the transportation budget. The caveat to that would be um, they're continuing to have auction, quarterly auctions for um, the Climate Commitment Act. And as I mentioned, revenues from that um, are dedicated to um, carbon reducing projects and programs. The first auction that occurred in February brought in significantly more revenue than was anticipated. And so if that continues, um, there may be some, some additional funding available in that um, specific category. Um, in terms of policies, I know that there's already some discussions occurring about um, adjustments that may be needed to the Blake bill, um, the Blake fix or the, the bill that was passed through the special session um, was 
very much a compromise. And um, when that happens, especially during a special session, um, there are details that are overlooked. And so I expect that topic to return, um, even though it won't have the same urgency that it did this session. Um, I also think housing is going to continue to be a, a hot topic. Housing and workforce, I would say, were probably like two of the big themes from this session. I think those will remain for next session as well. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, thank you very much. I will reinstate that um, you did a fantastic job, but I'm going to look at all my council members and I'm going to look at the citizens, everybody else. That pursuit law did not go near far enough. And I have four videos, if maybe you'd like to see of them, our officers almost getting killed, literally run over because of that pursuit law does not allow them to chase people. And I just think that is something that goes along with the Blake ruling that we need to take care of our citizens. So but you did thank you. I'm gonna wherever we are when that creek when that gets done, I'm gonna call my friend. No. So <laughs> you will be there. Okay. And uh, thank you very much and go get some rest. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. You're sorry. She's a hard working person. Okay, with that, we are going on to the, we have Kim and Jeff both, or just Kim? SR 522 retaining wall update. I'm going to do part one. Jeff's gonna do part two. This is not the exciting and great part that the mayor warned you about earlier. That will be Jeff. There you go, set the stage. <laughs> wow. Um, I'm gonna talk about um, really the, the codes, the statutes, the case law that really provide the framework that council has to work within when it passes regulations for projects like um, Sound Transit's project and washed up projects. He does have a lot of authority to adopt local regulations. Those There are parameters even within that. They have to be um, consistent with your comprehensive plan, which you work very hard to pass. Um, they have to be rationally related to a legitimate city interest. Um, trees and aesthetics, all those things are legitimate interests of the city. They can be arbitrary and capricious. We can't ignore facts. We need to look at studies and information when you pass those. And there has to be a nexus and rough proportionality so that you are requiring people to mitigate for damage that they are doing with their project, not something else. And it has to be in about the same amount of mitigation as the negative impact they're causing. And you, you do that really whenever you are um, looking at passing new ordinances for the city. The, so your authority is bumping up some other very strong authority that the state legislature have, has given to Sound Transit and WashDOT in this case. Uh, one of the biggest ones is essential public facilities. So these in general, I would say, are things that are very hard to cite. And the state legislature uh, didn't want every city to be able to say, no, you're not putting a jail here. No, you're not you know, putting whatever it is, the next NIMBY thing. And so they they protected essential public facilities. And the statute, the Growth Management Act says, no local comprehensive plan or development regulation may preclude the siting of essential public facilities. And then case law has worked on what does preclude mean? Um, and it's a good definition for the entities that are building the facilities. It says you're making it impractical or incapable of being performed or accomplished by the means employed or at command. That leaves um, a lot of decision-making in the entities that are building those cities and much less in the cities that are trying to mitigate the impacts of those facilities. You still can require uh, and put in local legislation um, mitigation of those local impacts though. Generally, you have that authority. I've provided in the memo some of the definitions um, that are in the GMA and elsewhere for Sound Transit and WashDOT, um, just if you wanna to refer to those. And then you, the, the city's authority to, to um, adopt regulation is also bumps up against WashDOT's authority. And it is very broad. They have 
the power to exercise all powers and perform all duties necessary, convenient, or incidental to the planning, locating, designing, et cetera, state highways. So that would include the, the project on 522 that's coming through um, with Sound Transit. So we have to watch out for a state entity um, preempting any city authority to regulate something. And so that's what we're bumping up against when you look at that WashDOT regulation. What is the city allowed to regulate that WashDOT? Um, it has not taken full authority over, or is there anything where we might be able to add something um, that they haven't already um, you know, defined what the regulation is? It's tricky. <laughs> to use a very legal term, tricky. Um, Sound Transit, they have the authority in two statutes to plan and implement a high capacity transportation system in the region. So they have that broad authority to plan and implement what they have planned for. So the city doesn't get to plan the BRT project. Um, I've included three, four hypotheticals that different council members have gotten asked about or have seen. And so I included those to try and give an idea of what I thought a court would do. The city imposed regulatory th authority like the question asked the city to. And I've turned my answers in, in what I thought a court would do. And I say a court because if the city were to deny a permit, from sound transit or condition a permit of sound transit in some regulatory way, the appeal of that would, would go to Superior Court under the Land Use Petition Act. It might first have an appeal here with our hearing examiner, but it would go to Superior Court. We've talked a lot about the Growth Management Board and what would go there on appeal. Those are the actual ordinances you pass, not the implementation and permits. So. That's why I put these in terms of what I thought a court would do. Um, so I talked, I answered the question about Q jumps, and I, I do think that that would be a design issue that is within the planning authority of Sound Transit and design authority of WashDOT to require those. Um, requiring that only a certain number of trees be removed. Again, I think that one would be more. Um, arbitrary and capricious, probably it would lack study backup if we just picked a number and said, you know, no, we think you can put your BRT project in and only take out 100 trees. But what the city will do is look at those plans and look at the trees that have been identified for removal. And the arborist will weigh in on and issue that permit based on does that tree need to go? Can that tree be saved? What can we do? Um, so though each tree will be looked at. And that is that is defensible. Um, also noise mitigation, um, which is again an issue that I think is most likely within the authority of WashDOT. Um, and if the city were to pass a noise regulation, I think it would require an understanding of what do the WashDOT regulations say right now? Um, and what could we do that isn't in conflict with those, if anything? Um, so I, that's what I think we would have to do. Um, question about requiring a post-pandemic ridership study. I think that really squarely falls within planning decisions given to Sound Transit. So um, really this presentation only looks at that code statutory case law authority not at all of the other avenues that you and the administration and city staff have been pursuing. So I'm just drawing that box and you guys have done a lot of work outside of that box. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions. And I know Jeff is going to talk about everything outside that box. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much, and uh, Mr. Mayor, and thank you so much, City Attorney Pratt, for um, giving us this these guidelines to think about. Um, and I just want to make sure I fully understood your last point. 
when you said inside the box and outside the box, you're talking inside the box are code that we might write. Yes. Um, that would govern permits or requirements that we have for issuing a permit, for example. Yes. But when you're talking about outside the box, you're talking about the conversations that we are having to negotiate, to ask for what it is we think our community would benefit from. Is that, have I got that? Yes, clear? you got that right. To lobby, I heard uh, someone talking about having a lot of citizens show up at a sound transit board meeting, all those kinds of things. Those are all completely permissible. Yes. Fine. Don't worry you as a city attorney. Not it's at what all. We, it's what we write in the ordinances or the resolutions or the requirements for permits. That's, That's what... when I get hives. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Um, okay, guys, get ready. Jeff's coming. Hey. We got a lot big much shoes to fill there, buddy. I hate to disappoint you, but that was the exciting part. <laughs> And the mic on. Doc. The, I'm on. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Um, that, that was the exciting part. So, um, all right. So we've got the, uh, just a presentation to show kind of where we stand with um, the wall update as well as some other miscellaneous topics that are related to that. Um, so we'll hit forward to it. So we've got five uh, items that we're going to be looking at. One is the interagency structure. Um, can, excuse me, uh, Director Perigo, can you speak up, please? You're, it's it's hard to hear you even with the mic. Okay. I'm and trying. I want to make sure the audience can hear you too. Okay. Thank you. If, if I'm speaking too softly or it doesn't pick it up, please it, just let me know. You're soft. <laughs> okay let's try again um so we've got the five different categories of, of items that we're going to be looking at interagency structure again miss pratt had, had spoken to, to that degree a little bit um the wall face vegetation fencing and trees those are the five areas that we do want to hit tonight um first of all I do want to talk about the uh, relationship between Sound Transit, uh, WashDOT, and City of Lake Forest Park. And as far as WashDOT and City of Lake Forest Park, the primary um, relationship that we have is through the conformed agreement. And that covers the ownership and maintenance. I'm sorry. It's like, there's an example. The primary relationship is, and I couldn't hear what that word was. Primarily relationship between um, WashDOT um, and the Save Lake Forest Park is the conformed agreement that that marries or that um, establishes the ownership and maintenance obligations between WashDOT and municipalities along state highways. And uh, for us, we have two state highways. Obviously, it's Ballinger Way and Bothell. So that includes the Sound Transit Project on 522. So when we start talking about a project like like we have with Sound Transit, their relationship is directly with WashDOT. So they they have to abide by WashDOT standards and the conformed agreement comes into play to some degree. Um, so that's kind of the first leg of this triangle. The next one is when City of Lake Forest Park comes into play and Sound Transit uh, is kind of in the middle between WashDOT and the City of Lake Forest Park. Our relationship with Sound Transit is, is regarding our, our permitting requirements, ordinances and the abundance with Casey, the King County Transportation Manual. Those are the things that come into play that we have um, discretion of with discussion with, with Sound Transit. Again, that conformed agreement still exists between WashDOT and the city of Lake Forest Park. State, could you just stay there a second? Yeah. Mayor, I have a question. It's for Mayor. Yes. Um, Jeff, is the conformed agreement an actual document? Yes, it is. Okay. And is it something that we update periodically with WashDOT? Or I, I just have not uh, heard of that before. Yeah, the last time it was updated was uh, 2013. Okay. Thank you. 
very much. So the, the way that I, I sort of think about this, again, I've been in construction for 30 years or so. And the way I look at this is, is Washdot is the owner. Sound Transit is like the general contractor. And Save Lake Forest Park is, is akin to a subcontractor. So there's some, some sort of relationships of that nature between the three parties here. That's, again, kind of a simplistic way for, for me I to I would say it. we're like Washdot. We both have requirements. <laughs> <laughs> So with, with the conformed agreement and our agreement with WashDOT is, and again, this is just an example, um, their typical uh, wall design that they would provide for us or give to us is a fractured fin or a random board. And that is obviously one thing that the city would not um, necessarily agree to or want, which is why we get, uh, are in negotiations and, and discussions with Sound Transit and in turn, they're working with, with WashDOT to effectuate some of the changes that we are looking to see. And so, again, that is uh, for uh, retaining walls with cities with a population less than 25,000, which is us, that would be a wall that WashDOT would own and maintain. So we do have some differences that are coming up with some of the agreements that we're making. Thanks, Matt. Um, so... As we just saw the fractured fin, that's the one that's pictured on the left. That is primarily what they would, WashDOT would provide for us as part of this, this contract or this agreement and, and project with Sound Transit. However, the one that the uh, was presented at the uh, Brookside Elementary open house through Sound Transit was the uh, motif that was on the right-hand side, which is the tree. That seemed to get uh, very good traction from that event, as I recall. Um, so that's that is what we're working towards with Sound Transit and Washdot to um, provide us with something akin to that. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Um, so, Director Perigo, I my understanding is that the tree motif design was something that Washdot has done elsewhere, and that, that was part of what they asked: is we'll show us something that we've done elsewhere. That is correct. So that gave us a certain amount of momentum. That is correct. We, okay. we worked with them, we talked with them and said, okay, well, we don't want that. What can we have? Mm -hmm. And they said, well, if you find some, some design elsewhere that we've done before, we will consider it. So, yes. Yeah. So thank you to our staff for finding a different design elsewhere. <laughs> So the second item that we're looking at, in, in addition to the walls, is the vegetation that we're we're trying to effectuate onto um, the wall. Um, if you look on the right hand side, we do have, uh, I believe that's a shot from 522, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, what you see there is, again, that would be akin, very similar to what we're what's being proposed for a good portion of the long wall, or the high wall that we have uh, southbound um, along 522. We've got the crash barrier at the bottom, and then we have basically the wall, unless we're able to install those those vine pockets. And I know and understand that there's some potential for those things not to work as well as we'd like them to be. But again, if we can, within our wall ordinance, um, get as many of those those pockets in there, we may be able to get uh, the look that we're shooting for. Um, but again, on, yes. So just, just a question. So this slide is entitled WashDOT Standards Deviation. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Is is does that mean that this is part of their standards or it deviates from their standards? This technically that would say would be a deviation. It's one of those agreements that we're trying to to create with them to, to establish that we are able to do this. They've done this before, but it's not their standard. Okay, thank you. So again, this is this. These are all uh, four or five agreements that we're trying to um, or negotiations that we're trying to complete with WashDOT and currently Sound Transit is working with WashDOT to uh, to finalize that. And at the end of this, uh, there'll be a spreadsheet that kind of shows all the different differences that we're, we're working towards. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor, I have another question. So along those lines, are we parties to those discussions? We are not right now. So we don't actually know what Sound Transit's saying in those discussions, except what they tell us they're saying. That's correct. 
And do we separately talk to WashDOT then and try to find out what's going on? We have spoken to them directly okay. at times, yes. Okay, because uh, it seems to me that there's a potential for what I would call deviation <laughs> in the conversations if we're not on top of it. Uh, and that would be unfortunate mm -hmm. to think it's going one way and have it come out in a draft agreement with WashDOT and Sound Transit in another. So I'm sure you understand that. I just want to underscore it a little. Sure. <laughs> Thank every, you. Every indication is that it's going in the, the direction in which we're, we're seeking. Okay. Well, that is good. But I'd like to see the words as someone who happens to be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> And then the next item that we really spent a lot of time working with Sound Transit on, uh, as well as WashDOT with this, is uh, the initial um, design had two easements, one a permanent and temporary. And what that would mean is that there would be the wall, whatever that looked like from the beginning, uh, with a chain link fence on top. And then at some distance behind it would be a second chain link fence. And that was something that we certainly did not want to uh, create a, an open or a space, um, kind of a no man's land space, if you will. Um, but that was part of WashDOT's request or requirement to have access to the back of the wall so they could in, uh, uh, inspect the drainage that is part of the wall and be able to drive a vehicle up there. So that was something that we um, fought hardly to, to, to get. Um, change and that's again one of those deviations that we're looking for as part of that agreement and do we know that we're successful everything is trending that way that is that is my understanding all of these things <clears throat> that i'm that i'm speaking of is are those things that we're we're having sound transit negotiate with washed out right now to make those happen and every indication is that they're going to happen So here are the proposed obligations and changes that we're looking for um, based on those things that we just looked at. Um, I'll start from the top. Wall, the structural element of the wall, um, whether it be what we have is the design element, then the next column is the maintenance obligations per the existing confirmed agreement. The third column is those things that we're looking to modify. And then the fourth column is just the replacement. So the first one is the wall, the structure of the wall, which is really the the biggest item you can think of with that wall. And that's regardless of how this, this plays out, the state is responsible for that. The wall facing, uh, with that, the city would be um, responsible for the, mod the, uh, the maintenance of that, which is primarily graffiti removal, those sorts of things. Uh, the next one would be the vegetation, which is the vines that we're looking at regardless of how that played out. Again, the city would be responsible for that if we were successful in getting that put in. The drainage at the top of the wall, that's one of those things that, um, again, WashDOT wanted to have access to the back of the wall with those extra easement uh, uh, distances there. And so we've agreed as a city to take on that responsibility for the inspection. And by, by doing that, we're, that's what created the ability to have that wall on top, uh, the, the fence on top of the wall as opposed to the, the, the double fencing. Uh, the rail fencing top, and again, we were trying to not have those double fencing, so we just uh, were able to, uh, again, at this point, be able to negotiate so that the fence is on top of the wall, as opposed to having, again, double fencing. Um, and then, obviously, the fencing that would be for the right-of-way access, um, if the fence is on top of the wall, there's no need for the fencing, so uh, that, that issue goes away. Yes, that's very good. So just to clarify, if you can go back to the image of the double fencing. So what the proposed modified uh, agreement that's in the negotiations is instead of having that black uh, chain link fence and then having the, the wood look fence and that gap in between, that wood look fence now just moves to the top of the wall. Correct, and what we're proposing. And, and it's a contiguous neighbor backyard there mm -hmm. without any additional sort of Correct. separation. So there'll just be an easement behind the wall just for us to go back and, and look at the um, drainage to make sure that's uh, just inspect the drainage. So then our responsibility would be coordinate with the owners to get back there and do that inspection, but correct. Uh, it wouldn't it wouldn't be on WashDOT to do any of that if, uh, in this per this latest agreement. Correct. Thank you. Yes, Captain Fair time. Yes, thanks. Um so I I'm, I'm, if you can go one slide forward again. 
uh, back forward okay. forward the table that you had yeah thanks mm -hmm. um so the drainage trenches drain into what i'm sorry the drainage trenches drain into what uh, that drain that those drains are at the top of the wall mm -hmm. and they drown drain, drain down through the wall and then out into the street out well, in into so there's so, so there's no requirement for a vault or anything to det detain the stormwater no 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 thanks And then this is where the pictures come into play here. Um, this is a street view image. We do have uh, some renderings to look at. We also have the initial uh, street view and or other pictures to uh, get us started. So this is the, fir the first view that we've got uh, renderings for. This is the existing from, I believe it was later on uh, last year or sometime. Um, it's the east view looking west, uh, just, uh, just west of 165th Street. So in, in the distance there are the stoplights at 165th. And so the first rendering is going to be year one. That is the proposed look for that from that set, roughly the same angle. Um, you can see that the tree uh, the tree motifs on the wall. We have the what we would uh, propose is trex fence on top of the wall. That would be again be the only primer, the only fence up there. Um, and then in median uh, center median, we do have some landscaping as well as some trees. Again, this is year one, and that would be year five. And we do see the trees are uh, obviously getting bigger and the vines are starting to take hold um, on the wall. Yes. Hey, Mr. Mayor, yes. <laughs> question. Sorry. Um, Director Perigo, so do you have any sense of um, the height of the wall that is currently being considered? Is it the same as before? Is there any reduction in height? Because when I look at that, I see a bus up against the wall, and the this is a pretty, still a pretty massive wall. So the scale with the with the reduction of the easement, the height of the on the top for the top, the height of the wall hasn't shrunk at all. Is that that, that does not change based on the easement? Okay. No. Okay. Thank you. I was hoping. Councilman I'm just going to sit like this. As I understand it, the, the wall that we're looking at there that has the, the vines going up, that's the vine pocket style. Correct. correct. So that's why we're seeing that sort of stripe at the bottom. And that's the, the growth pocket is right at that level. That is correct. Okay. And our, our goal is to get as many vine pockets as we can. I think uh, with the ordinance that will hopefully make it either six feet, 10 feet or, or some some number that would help to cover that wall at some point. Okay, thank you. So the next view we have uh, is right around uh, Northeast 157th place, looking east, north, however you want to consider that. Um, and then this is what that would look like, yes. Keep, keep in mind, um, the one thing I would ask you to keep in mind is that this image of uh, the trees in the background uh, was taken during the winter time. So they do not have all the, the leaves that some of the other trees had in previous street view. So it's a little different. Again, this is, this is year one. And then year five, not a huge visual. Um, change from those two. Um, obviously in the median, we don't have any, there's no uh, center median for street trees. Um, so it's kind of the- um, Yes, thank you. And thank you very much. These are, this is very helpful uh, visualization, but I am struck um, as I look at this and thinking about driving the stretch and thinking about a comment that we had earlier from one of our residents that there is no lighting that I see here. And um, I just wondered if in any of the conversations that you have had with Sound Transit or, or with WashDOT, whether there has been any discussion of increasing the amount of lighting on the corridor through Lake Forest Park. And I wanna just sort of give a little comment about that too. There are people in our our community who would wish that we wouldn't increase the lighting because they believe in the dark skies um, 
uh, are better for our environment than than a lot of uh, additional lighting. But I did just wonder whether any conversations had occurred around the lighting, particularly along the sidewalk. Uh, there were con there were con uh, conversations about the lighting. Uh, we were asked that, and uh, within internal discussions, the direction that was received was whatever we currently have is what we want to put back, which is primarily intersections, bus stops, those sorts of things. There, the um, idea of adding lighting, as you suggested, would probably be um, not well received if we did light up the entire, make it more of a highway, if you will, than what we currently have. Deputy Mayor French. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Director Pergo, for uh, the presentation. Uh, on the topic of lighting, I tend to be one of those people that really appreciate stark skies, but I really appreciate appreciate safety much more. And and the the, the Mr. Harris raised, has raised a, an excellent question here. This section, particularly right here, without a sidewalk, when it is the rainy, dark, dank days of winter, this is is dangerous to drive because of lack of lack of lighting. It is pitch black at mm -hmm. night and um, I really have concerns here with the addition of pedestrians on this this sidewalk that at least some sort of lighting for you know safety uh, and security really makes a lot of sense. And my question is this relative to Bothell, Kenmore, et cetera, those folks seem to have found a way to get lighting incorporated into the, their entire corridor. How are we not able to do that? <laughs> I would say we could do that. Um, that would be a cost that we would have to bear. And um, again, we're, we will be receiving the 90% plans shortly. So if we would like to do something, we should consider that fairly soon. Does anybody know why there's no lighting there now? Because that is the darkest piece of road in the state, probably I can tell you at night, but for some reason there's no lighting there. So who decided that and why was that decided way back when? Did people not want lights because of the views are being blocked or? Well, there was no sidewalk. Um, well, I so I think that. now the, the thing is, I think that Sound Transit should pay for lighting for sidewalk safety if they have to put in a sidewalk. That's that's Just, the thing rather than the city viewing it as our expense. If I may follow up, please. Um, the question is, from Director Perigo, do we know that Kenmore did not pay for and Bothell did not pay for those lights or didn't pay for those lights? The reason why I ask is because the initial revamping of the section of 522 between 145th and 155th, when they added the addition of the 153rd, but when the stop, the light there after multiple fatalities, that lighting was added along that section by WashDOT. It was not, the cost was not incurred by the city. So I can look into that. I appreciate that. I think we all would. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes. And and I would say I think perhaps there's a balance here for pedestrian scale lighting mm -hmm. yeah. over highway mm -hmm. lighting. So I mean I think that we can strike a balance here that'll improve safety without creating an undue lighting burden on the neighbors or um, you know the dark sky issue. So please look into it. The Kenmore Bridge, the new Kenmore Bridge has that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it has an opportunity to yeah. be part of, depending on you know the identity, like the the Kenmore Bridge has, has sort of, yeah. they're, they're striking types of lights because of the way that they've done that architecture of that bridge. I'm not recommending those specific lights, but I mean I think there's an opportunity here to make some something nice out of this that it currently doesn't exist. Would you suggest some pedestrian lighting in that um, uh, strip? between the sidewalk and the curb is that mm -hmm. I think that would be appropriate okay. for this for, for conditions like okay. this yeah okay thank you okay next slide and the, the final series of rend renderings here again this is the um, uh, west view from 157th place and this one is a little different than previous two Yeah, this situation we do have the um, the wall itself petering down from either side to basically just the crash barrier um, on the southbound lanes. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I'm sorry, uh, Director Perigo. Just question: uh, I see the sidewalk here on the downslope side. What is the status of the negotiations regarding that sidewalk? As far as is it in 
going to continue to be in the mix or is it something that is going to be replaced by something else with a deep sort of a tangential deep. parallel the sidewalk will fall short of uh of town center um and there will be a connection from 41st to the burke elementary Trail. can you repeat that i'm not sure i heard all that yeah the, the sidewalk um on the lake side will continue on until the houses end and they do not have access um or they have access to 41st street oh okay and yes. then there will be a connection from 41st so up to the corner of bothell way and the end of 41st there will be sidewalk all the way to the end there where the houses are no not all the way to the 41st no it will fall short of that if they have access to 41st up out the lakeside and not bothell way those houses will not receive sidewalk that's you it. mean so the houses that go lot to lot on 41st there won't be a sidewalk in back of those I I'm trying to figure I'm trying to visualize this can you count them go and help mark oh, on that on that topic so if, if let's say I'm at 153rd street and I want to walk to town center what would my walk path be I believe on that you would have to go to 165th and come down to 41st and then okay. hop on. So at 165th, you would walk down a uh, block to 41st and then take 41st and then that would reconnect back to Bothell Way just before town center. It would connect to the Burke Island Trail and then then over to uh, Bothell Way. You have to take the dirt trail down to get to but, uh Burke Gilman from 41st because it's my street uh at the at that point uh council member they will be installing uh, a natural pathway to get there that's that wow I didn't even know that and that's the street I live on I have never seen that in any of the designs so they're they're still working on that they're looking to get pro, um uh right of entry so, for so a survey get the straight there'll be a sidewalk from 153rd <sighs> to 165th only then you have to walk down the hill and walk down 41st which doesn't necessarily have the best side it's a narrow sidewalk mm -hmm. and then there's going to be a cut through path to get down to Burke Gilman Trail to go to town center I I thought the sidewalk was going to go all the way to town center so I'm kind of amazed I I, I a, Riddle, has anybody got a whiteboard like we used to use in the old days? I, just, I, I have those 60% drawings, and I think in the 60%, I feel like I see a sidewalk continuing right. That's what a, I thought. along Bothell Way yes. from 165th um, up into to, to the to the um, town center area. So I think we could we we need to have that firmed up. This is the issue with the drawings having too many overlays. It's hard to tell what the line work is. Um, but I, I think that that does continue in the 60%. And I look forward to the 90% confirming that. That is where you'll see the change, where it does, again, it, go, it goes past 165th towards towards town center. And then I think it goes I, six, six or seven. Has the city agreed to that? Because I thought we had asked for the sidewalk all the way along. And that's partly why we switched to the lakeside. Remember, it used to have a sidewalk on both sides. And then the question was which side to make it on. Um, and it was picked to be the lakeside. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, just point of clarification. The reason why I asked the question, and we kind of got all over the place here, is because my understanding from direct, from Administrator Hill that there was a request from uh, the Beach Association to have the sidewalk detour down and to avoid the additional width that would be required for the sidewalk to the northeast of the bus stop and what the sidewalk was that this is why I asked the question I didn't know I was wondering what the status of the you know discussions were about what what's actually going to occur and I guess it's an important discussion for us to have because there's definitely confusion my understanding for Mr. Hill was that the first five houses would have have a sidewalk because they have no other direct access to to the, the BRT station yes and then beyond that there would not be in the idea the, the change there would not be a sidewalk uh and um so anyway i the reason why i asked the question is what if, if there are status what the status of the negotiations were so 
something maybe we don't know. Wait, oh, yes. So to clarify, and I'm pointing at this so we don't see that. Is it there? But I'm pointing along the stretch of five foot two. I've got one sixty there. So these five houses, this, these five houses, is what you're referring to. That's correct. Yes. Okay. So there's no sidewalk on this stretch here. And those are the no, lot to lot houses. That's what I meant. Okay. They go from 41st to Bothell Way. That's what I. That's Matt. that's what I think you're saying, uh, Deputy Mayor. Yeah, Matt, go go a little bit, go just a little bit above, a little go go down the screen towards 165th. <laughs> <laughs> um, it literally it's five lots in. Is what is my understanding? Okay. Oh, there um, now you got buildings. There you go. Go, go there down. Go. Yeah. This way a little bit. Move, move the map south. This way. So we can see north. Not the cursor, the map. Drag the map. Now back up. You mean to drive? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I got the other way. The other way. Other way. The other way. That, that makes more right. sense to me. You can see, you see and again, right here. Yeah. Yeah. Far. Right. Far. and it yeah. goes all the way here. And when you go yeah. 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 get to Sorry. 41st, the there's same. a sidewalk yeah. cut on both sides. I think there's a sidewalk. There's a, in the sixty uh, percent. That's correct. Now, of course, that's there post negotiation. Yeah. Matt's cursor is is where it was. My understanding is where the, the request was for it to stop. And again, I don't yeah, know. That that, is, that is correct. Okay. That it picks up the first five or six homes. Okay. And, and at that point, it does get very narrow. You've got um, a bridge that would have to be installed over the bypass. And, and, and this is to reduce the takings, right? I those I understand that for the but the I, I and I understand the difference between the five lots and the ones that come after that. I didn't realize there was going to be a, a a pathway kind of down the hill to Burke Gilman that was going to be paved. Yes. To replace where the dirt trail is now. I'm not sure if it's going to be where the dirt trail is, okay. but at some point in there, again, they're, they're trying there. to figure okay. this out right Thank now. Thank you. It'd be The drawings do seem to show the sidewalk all the way. So, um, uh, On this map, can you show where the pedestrian path would connect between 41st and the Burke Gilman? They're currently working that out with, uh, with that property. They're trying to still get access to it, right of entry. I can right, right about, somewhere, yeah, right about where somewhere around there. Yeah, a little bit to the south, but kind of where the that's where the existing path is anyway. So. Yeah, you don't here. Yeah. Any more pictures? I think so. <laughs> Kill the map. Kill the map. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Thank, um, you thank you very much. This has been really helpful. And, you know, as someone who hadn't paid attention or uh, been aware of all the changes on the sidewalk. I appreciate that information and the the visualizations and so forth. And I appreciate that we're um, advocating um, for the deviations. And I appreciate that. I just would encourage us to formally request, mm -hmm. perhaps in writing, to see the draft agreement between WashDOT and Sound Transit before they sign it and declare it final. So uh, uh, I would think that we would that that's reasonable to request, and I wouldn't want us to be shut out of having some input into that document to make sure the specifications that we think have been agreed to are are reflected. So just sure. encouragement to, you know, spend more on city legal services. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just we, to be better to be safe than sorry. We certainly That's did fun. this week, Councilmember yeah. Bobby, already. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. All right. All right. This um let's see if we got yeah, th this would be year five from that same angle. Um Again, there's a little bit more greenery, a little more trees uh, of age. And then just a few uh, final comments with the tree removals and replacements that we've we've looked at. Um, we've reduced the numbers from 490 down to 385 based on some of the um, direction that our arbors had given to Sound Transit and, and how they looked at trees, whether it be the critical root zone or the in interior uh, root zone. Um, and that, again, we had talked about uh, King County perhaps having a replacement program that might be available to them um, at our work session. Uh, with that, King County would pretty much take ownership of 
placing and maintaining trees for three years. Um, so that's that's an opportunity. And one final note at the bottom, project staging areas are not going to be on Lake Forest Park. They will not have anything here. And that was, um, again, first of all, there's not a whole lot of place to go. And second, if they did, then obviously that would uh, be detrimental for trees and other, other infrastructure. So. And yes, thank you very much. And thank you so much for that clarification that there will be no staging areas in the city of Lake Forest Park. It does, though, beg the question of where are they going to be? <laughs> we know. Uh, in Kenmore. In Kenmore. All right. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Councilman Riddle. Um, do you know, uh, or do you know when we might know what uh, the 385 trees are, their, their sizes, their species, their uh, condition? Is that something that is being prepared? I'd have to defer to the arborist on that one. Um, Sound Transit, I believe, will have all those uh, reductions on the 90% drawings. Uh, and that may indicate those uh, details that you were looking for. Okay. Usually it will indicate the removal, but not necessarily its condition, its age, its, its okay. you know, those sorts of things. So I think I would encourage us to get that so that we have a, a true understanding of what that 385 or less <laughs> number really means. Understood. Yes. If I could, yes. Just on point, um, I had the opportunity, I mean, as did you, I think, Mr. Mayor, to speak with the sound transit arborist at that uh, meeting that we had at the school a while back, and I found him to be um, very amenable and sympathetic to the Lake Forest Park citizens who were just talking with him about trees. And we, we actually worked with him on identifying certain groups of trees that we felt were uh, significant trees and important trees for the city. And he, I now see on some of the documents that I've seen since that in fact, yes, those trees have now been saved. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm hopeful that uh, we will get good information and that that arborist who works with Sound Transit um, understands the priorities of our city and is working to make the best of the situation. Councilmember Goldman. Um, yeah, I'd like to express my gratitude for the efforts that you and other staff members have done negotiating with Sound Transit and WashDOT. We heard from City Attorney Pratt that there are substantial limitations mm -hmm. on our city's authority about what we are allowed to do via ordinance. And you've made good progress negotiating about getting the retaining walls to look in in a form that is more what the city and what the public are looking for. Um, I mean, the nature of compromises, we don't get everything we want. I mean, I, I do think we should continue to push for some sort of pedestrian style, you know, pedestrian friendly lighting. And I will admit, I am never going to love a pedestrian detour off of 522, but I will accept that it seems like we're getting a pretty good amount of what we were asking for. So I appreciate your efforts there. Okay, anybody else? Yes, Councilmember. Thank you. I think uh, another element that I want us to consider is is the the nature of the motif that is the current front runner of the trees, and as that works when the wall is tall, but as the the wall shortens, it becomes less effective. Um, and uh, if there's a way to work in uh, an alternate motif that's something that's not that plain wall, something that's maybe lake related just it's a different visual that still sets it apart but doesn't look like a half cut down tree <laughs> we have discussed that oh, and you. the opportunity maybe for small bushes or some other smaller landscape and that might be appropriate for that size okay i appreciate that okay. oh what, what i i think there was a misunderstanding there it's it's the motif on the concrete panels she's talking about not the plantings Correct. The, mot the motif, when, when the wall peters down from, say, six feet down to two, that if we have the tree motif on that small section, it's going to be, scale. the scale will be really skewed. So instead of putting a tree motif, they may be able to put a, a small bush or something okay. like that. Thank you. I thought you were talking about planting bushes. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, because I understand it, the, the motifs are, are like, they're, they're forms. And so you don't, if you scale it, you have to purchase a whole new form. And, and so that is a cost that they would probably resist anyways. So I think an alternate motif would be appropriate. To okay. 
Thank you, Jeff. Um, I know we're all trying to get to the same thing, but I, you know, I can tell you everybody in this room, including Phil, who's not here right now, and I've walked in his office, have all had the same amount of frustration with sound transit. It's on every level we've been working and thanks to Phil and Jeff and Steve and Kim, I think they have more patience than most of us. So thank you again, Phil, thank you very much. With that, I guess we're gonna move on to ordinance and res oh, we got consent calendar. Anybody like to move consent calendar? So moved. Second. And move and second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 I, I just wanted to do a time check here. We're by yeah. my math, we're gonna be looking at 1130. I'm wondering if there's some items today that we might be able to consider tabling for discussion at our next meeting. How do we do 11.30? We have a lot of action items here. Yeah. Um, I'm Mr. Mayor, may I propose um, tabling resolution 23-1902 as an opportunity for us to consider the scope for the consultant? Now, what was that? That would be A. You want to or table that? Table D. D. No, I think he said 1902 D. A. A. Or A, 1892. A is 1902. 1902. 11. So the people that are here waiting to speak, you want to My not God. do them tonight? I was going to propose that we table it so that we have an opportunity to, to offer comments to yeah. the scope of work for the contract for which we are asked to take action on this evening. Yeah. I think that uh, we have, I would suggest issues that we wanna have them consider such as uh, cultural awareness and Native American heritage consideration, environmental issues associated with contaminated soils and also consider that uh, the charrette should be citizen focused rather than staff focused in order to that the vision and, and goals of this park be driven by the citizens rather than the staff. Okay, I'm just wondering, we haven't even heard from them yet, so how do we know they're not part of that? A reviewing of the scope. Okay. I, I would support that, Mr. Mayor. And while we're thinking about that, I was wondering, Ms. Pratt is under nine, the introduction referral of ordinance 23-1268. This is something that's time sensitive relative to revising the criminal code, or is this, it seems fairly perfunctory. Um, could we suspend our rules and just move forward after an introduction? We would like to have it passed by July 1st when the new state um, codes go into effect. I think it is very simple. Um, okay, I think we could probably move forward with that pretty quickly. Okay, Council, what do you want to do? Mr. Mayor, I think we have some very important issues here on this agenda, and I'm not actually willing to table any of it. I, I'm willing to work through it. Okay, okay. okay. that's what we'll do. We're gonna start right from the top, folks. We're in a 23-1268, amending chapter 9.04 of the Lake Forest Park Municipal Code, state criminal code provision. Thank you, Council. Um, you heard a lot of this background information tonight from Shelley Helder regarding the Blake fix. And I think you all know that um, City Administrator Hill and Chief Hardin and Prosecutor Roberts and myself, we were um, looking at what they were proposing. We were drafting legislation for the City Council to consider in case they did not pass anything, which they did in their special session. But that led us to this look at what the city's <laughs> current code um, says. And we have come up with these amendments that we are recommending to city council, which I think really um, put the council's intent more up to date and make it more clear. We're adopting misdemeanors and gross misdemeanors of the state as well as any other necessary um, RCWs that are needed for investigation, et cetera, making that clear. Adopting class C felonies that might be used for um, charging of attempt um, 
and solicitation and conspiracy. You need that felony to then charge the gross misdemeanor for say only attempt. So making that clear, um, we would be deleting some things that would then be redundant, um, cleaning up the disposal of forfeited firearms to remove some things about the sheriff. Um, you'll see that when I was talking to the chief, he asked if instead of only giving the authority to destroy the firearms, he also had the authority to trade or arrange for auction, which is allowed in the statute. He explained to me he he you know, does not see a need to do that, but he doesn't know what might come ahead and he needs to keep his evidence room um, manageable. And so it's just providing him that possibility if he needed to. Um, so he's just keeping the options that would be in the statute. So I'm happy to answer any questions tonight or online. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Pratt, for um, your hard work on this. Question regarding um, disposition of fines and forfeitures, as well as um, the various, one of the various decisions that was decided upon by the leg legislature and signed into law was the racing ordinance that, ref that allows forfeiture of vehicles uh, upon certain circumstances. Is this something that needs to be added to the mix to be compliant with state statute, which goes to effect on July 1st? No, this would this one is only cleaning up the forfeiture of firearms. Okay. And if if that racing statute has misdemeanors or gross misdemeanors in it, um, then this would say we are adopting that. Thank so you. we would be okay. Deputy okay. Mayor, I mean Councilmember Casover. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you very much, uh, Kim. You really have been doing a lot of work here this week. Um, I am going to state my opposition to the um, auction trading uh, of the, any firearms that are um, uh, that are for that are taken by our police department. I believe they should be destroyed, and I won't be voting for um, any trading or auctioning. To the point on that, just real quick. I understand that, but one time we did run into this and we got some very, very valuable antique rifles that they really were worth a lot, a lot of money. And it was a shame to melt them because we could have bought a lot of stuff for the police department. So we, we did make sure that we're following the state statute on those types of firearms yeah. um, that they would not, right. those should be auctioned under state statute and this would allow um, the police department to auction those particular okay. type. But I did hear about that as well. Yes. So I, I need to be clear, I need some clarification. The change that you are making here on 9.04.050 would allow the department to auction antiques? No. They're already allowed to do that. They're already allowed to do that. This, this would allow trading and or auctioning of any type of firearm. Yes. Okay. I just think we have too many of them. I don't want any more okay. of them. But Understood. I will relay that to the chief. And he was just looking for an option. He was not, he had no plans. Okay. Council Member Riddle, then Council Member Liebel. And, and, and I, I feel that that is probably not something I would support either. I understand that he, he appreciates having options. Um, but this code will outlive us. It may outlive him as chief. I think we want to be in a position where we're strongly uh, protecting our community um, and just not putting those back into the system. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and, and City Attorney Pratt for the uh, description ex explanations. Help me understand how this relates to what our neighbors are doing in other jurisdictions. Are we being consistent with what other uh, jurisdictions are adopting, or are we in any way an outlier? Um, other, some other jurisdictions are much more detailed um, in which misdemeanors and which gross misdemeanors they adopt um, from the state statute. So they don't adopt all of the misdemeanors and gross misdemeanors allowed and in state law, only some of them. And they might specifically say, 
you know, all of um, the firearm statutes except and list three. So um, we have Administrator Hill and Chief Harden and I did have discussion about later looking at that as a project and giving um, going through and looking at those particular ones and seeing if there were some uh, that council did not want to adopt. You probably heard Seattle is not enforcing the drug. It would be that type of thing where you would make the choice. No, we will not be charging that as a misdemeanor or a gross misdemeanor. So just to follow up. So ours is much more general. We have not decided to to take out certain uh, crimes with it, with that regard. Okay. Right. The code has been written differently since I think it was the 80s where LFP's code wasn't, criminal code was not written like that. There are some that are adopted specifically, but in general, it's this main language saying we adopt all of them. And if I may, just as a follow-up point to my distinguished council members, I also support stripping out the sale, trading, or auction of firearms okay. for the reasons that are identified here. Um, we have as many guns as we have people. More. 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 And um, I do not want to see more. Just so we'll pass that I, I too agree. I mean, I'm quite comfortable uh, with the, you know, the original uh, language about antique firearms um, preservation there. I really believe, uh, as my colleagues have said, uh, it really should be, must be destroyed and under pursuant to the state statute. Okay. Uh, we, we've got to do something and we need to continue um, to make at least small steps in the right direction and getting the numbers down. Okay. Thanks, Attorney Pratt, for your thoughts. But uh, when you were talking to Chief Harden, what was, go over his reasoning about why that uh, wording needed to be in the statute. Where he wanted the authority to be able to trade and arrange for auction. Right. You said something to the effect that he didn't know what was going to happen in the future. What was he foreseeing? Mm, he... He gave me the example of in the past, they have kept um, firearms and other things in their evidence room much too long, um, not getting them destroyed. He was just thinking that in the future, he may just need another option to be able to, um, to, to get rid of firearms that PD is holding. He just was looking for I might need another way to do this other than destruction. He did not have anything specific in mind. I don't, th this was not a hill for him to die on. And all right, so just so that everyone knows, since that seems to be more of an operational matter than a legislative matter, I'm going to express my opposition to that language as well then. Thank okay. you. I think it's more of a storage issue than yeah. anything. So it's, yeah. okay. it's a member of ODA. I uh, thank you very much uh, for this, and I also agree on um, eliminating the trading or auction opportunities for, unless it's antique or firearms of historical significance, as we already have in our in our code. Uh, the question I have for my colleagues is: If we, with that amendment, are we ready to adopt this tonight? Okay, and do we need a motion to uh, suspend, rules. suspend our three touch rules? So I move that we suspend our three touch rules for the um, uh, so to allow the adoption of uh, ordinance twenty three twelve sixty eight. As with the suggested amendment. With the suggested no, this is just, just a motion suspend to rules. suspend the rules. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Second. First off, it's been moved to remove the three touch rule and ordinance 23 1268. All those in favor at this time, please say aye. Aye. Okay. Somebody like motion. Do you? Um, aye. Go for it. Yes. So I'd like to make a motion to adopt ordinance. Hey, I lost the number. 23 1268. Uh, with an amendment to remove the suggested language in 904.050 relating to trading and auctioning of firearms. Second. Okay. 
It's been moved and second with the removal of that uh, council member for time. Uh, and with the proviso that it's not affecting the antique firearms and firearms language. Okay. okay. Any other discussion? Yes, Councilman Riddle. May, may I clarify? Uh, just so that it's very clear for the record, we're changing the language of uh, may either be destroyed, traded, or arranged for auction back to the original language must be destroyed. Yes. That's the, the specific change that we've asked for. Okay. Yes, Council Member. Yeah, um, at the risk of being a stickler, are we allowed to adopt an ordinance with an amendment, or do we need to officially vote on the amendment? And then vote on the underlying ordinance just to make sure it's clear what exactly we're voting on. You vote on the amendment. I think the I think the correct route is to move the ordinance, then make the motion for the amendment, and then return to, to the original yeah. motion, the original All right. ordinance. <laughs> so I so I I, I move the ordinance. Point of clarification. Yes. Um, going back to this historical uh, firearms, is it required in the RCW or is it an option within the RCW? It's required in the RCW. When I, I did specifically look um, and we already had that authority, as I was a little confused no, why it happened last time. I'm sorry. Is it uh, required or we have the authority to do? No, it's required. I can check for sure if you want. I can look it up. I would be curious to see if the RCW requires that historical firearms be auctioned or traded. I I can look it up. I know that when I looked at what our um, code said right now without any amendments, that the city, that the chief was allowed to auction off antique firearms. Councilmember Goldman. Um, I just looked it up and it is required. Antique firearms are exempt from destruction and shall be disposed of by auction or trade. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Yeah. okay, so where are we at, folks? This is our quick one. All right, so I am moving ordinance. It's on the other page. 23-1268, amending chapter 9.04 of the Lake Forest Park Municipal Code state criminal code provisions second and then i would like to move an amendment to that ordinance which strikes the language traded or arranged for auction and instead says must be destroyed second. Point, uh, point of order aren't the amendments voted on before the motion well, we haven't we voted, haven't voted on, on the motion. motion. Yeah. We haven't voted on the motion. No, but that's my point is that yes. you proceed with the amendment before the well, the amendment just got the first motion. and second. I was going to vote. And then I moved the amendment. Okay. And then we vote on the amendment and then we vote on the motion. It's nested. Thank you. Yeah, it, we're half nested. <laughs> All right. And then we have to get back out. Okay. okay. So, so the, uh, the amendment proposed <laughs> amendment is returning the language from may either be destroyed, traded, or arranged for auction to the original must be destroyed. Yes. So we're voting on I will the second amendment. that amendment. Yes. So all those in favor of that amendment, please say aye. 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 I'll call the question. All those in favor of ordinance 23-1268 as amended. Um, well, that's, that's what this actually says. Yeah. Yes. Amended chapter 9.04 of Lake Forest Park Municipal Code State Criminal Code Provisions. Please say aye. Aye. Any nays? Okay. Well, that was smooth. Thank you. And Carlin would be proud. Man. That was true. Jurassic Carlin. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Kim, you're already up here. So, yeah. King County Opioid Abatement Council Memorandum of Understanding. That sounds simple. Right. So, Council, you have already authorized the One Washington Memorandum back in April of 2022. This is another step in that. It required the creation of opioid abatement councils. This agreement would do that for King County. Um, it's actually a pretty simple agreement. Um, 
there would be two members from King County, one from Seattle and one chosen by the Sound Cities Association. Those um, persons would have to have experience pertaining to one or more of the approved purpose for expenditure of those funds. Um, it just provides oversight. It doesn't really monitor every decision the city makes on how it's gonna spend those funds. But if you decided not to spend funds, then it would go to this um, committee and or if someone said hey lake forest park is spending the funds on something they shouldn't be then that would be brought to their attention under complaints um you have to keep records you would pro be providing some reports to this um committee you pay 10 percent of the funds you receive from these settlement agreements to uh, this committee for its administration. If all the uh, that 10% wasn't spent, it would be um, credited to you for the next year. Um, this originally was gonna have that 10% taken out of the city's REIT funds. There was some discussion with King County about that. It seemed a little convoluted, although I'm sure it would have passed muster. Um, but they agreed there were a few cities who had that concern. And so um, instead, the other arrangements can be made. And what I understand for Administrator Hill is Lake Forest Parks just wants to pay the county its 10% and not have it. That will just be very clear where the money came from. And that'll be it. Uh, any questions? And this we need to have this passed by July 1st as well. That is the request from the county. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I don't have any questions. And if there are no questions, I'd like to move to suspend our rules to pass. Uh, let's see. It doesn't even have a number. It doesn't, uh, the, member, the, uh, the King County Opioid Abatement Council member, Memorandum of Understanding. Second. Okay, it's been moved and second to suspend the three touch rule on King County Opioid Abatement Council Memorandum of Understanding. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any nays? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to go ahead and move for adoption um, King County it's Opioid Abatement. There is a resolution number if that's helpful. Is there? Oh, Resol no one. Further down. Oh. Further down? No. 23. Oh, yeah, there's, yeah, there I'm go. sorry. I'd like to move resolution 23 1901, a resolution of the City of Council. The city of Lake Forest Park, Washington, authorizing the mayor to execute the King County Regional Agreement Opioid Abatement Council. Second. Okay, it's been moved and second to move. What is it? Uh, Twenty-three dash nineteen oh one. Yep. Okay, for a tie. Thanks, thanks, Attorney Pratt. And uh, one question I had was: the ten percent is pretty standard for uh, overhead on these kinds of committees. It's actually um, was a number in the. Um, it's you know, one Washington agreement. Okay. So they just moved it down. Yeah. Um, so it's been moved and second. Any other discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Nay, it's passed unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Yeah. Okay, now we're moving on to Ordinance 23-1270. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct, Mr. Mayor. And I guess that means that I am up. Okay. Uh, and I'm sorry that we lost members of our public here, but for the members who get members of the public who are out there or who can watch this in the recording, um, as many of you know, this body has been working for a very long time on a uh, retaining wall ordinance as it pertains to our state our state routes, of which we have two, of course, State Route 104 and 522. We've held eight policy meetings since January of this year, including some other touches, uh, including presentations by members of the public and et cetera. Um, and I want to say firstly that um, the declaration of an emergency um, relative to this ordinance is something that I know this body does not take lightly. I certainly do not. There, uh, it is something that is uh, is allowed under the Growth Management Act and under state statutes. We are allowed to do this in certain specific circumstances. 
And I will just outline a couple of things here just for the edification of everybody so we're all on the same page. As I indicated to my, in my email to you all, uh, under the Growth Management um, Act, the city is authorized to adopt interim regulations without holding a public hearing. However, we have held a public hearing, one public hearing. It's the intent of, uh, as I will outline our path forward tonight, we will be holding a second public hearing. My computer just went away. We will be holding a second public hearing <clears throat> uh, scheduled for the 20, I believe the 22nd, uh, which is our next regular meeting of the city, um, the city council. And the reason for this is to ensure that we are not left flat footed should there be a, an application pending uh, on any front. And as I indicated in our meeting on Monday, I felt expressed concern that we might be letting the perfect become the enemy of the very good. I think we have a very good ordinance here relative to the retaining walls. The only place that we had bookmarked for continued discussion was the question of noise abatement. Uh, and I will say that the um, when we do notice the public hearing, should this body continue, continue to move forward with passage of this ordinance on an emergency basis, that we will ensure that the additional considerations that this council has brought forth relative to noise abatement, et cetera, will be uh, listed as uh, one of the things that the council is considering um, uh, after input at that public hearing. Um, once again, I want to reiterate while my computer is rebooting here and it's going to take forever for me to get my notes up, but I'll do this, continue to do this off the cuff, that stating an emergency is something we haven't done for a very, very long time. And the last time it was done was during the town center process, 2019. Gene, if I'm not correct, Ms. Pratt, I think, um, Mr. Pratt. it's been a long time. Um, and once again, as we had our conversation on Monday, uh, after that conversation, there was um, some th thoughts that, um, that there was a real definite need for us to consider this and make sure that we put a stake in the ground relative to the values and the characteristics, uh, character of our, our, our community. And um, I think it's really important for us to consider this. So um, I'm going to, with that, um, and I think my, there my computer, computer's coming back. So again, this is specifically about retaining walls. And there is, um, Council Member Bodie had, may, has made some suggestions in the past about uh, the noise component, uh, noise abatement component, and that will be something that we will be considering at, uh, down the line. Uh, once again, I want to make sure that we try to keep ourselves constrained to the guardrails uh, that we set for ourselves about this ordinance previously, that the previously decided upon copy and the changes that we were looking for, I believe, have been very accurately affected in this document by our staff. Thank Many thanks to Mr. Bennett and Ms. Pratt for working very, very hard this week. I can't tell you how hard they worked to get this uh, put together and make sure that the uh, changes that were requested by this body were in place. Um, okay. And with that, I'm happy to have Ms. Pratt or myself field any questions. And I think my com computer is completely fried. I got the pin wheel of death. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As you know, I'm a Sound Transit employee and this ordinance does affect a project for which Sound Transit is constructing in Lake Horse Park. While I don't believe there's a conflict of interest, I will recuse myself from the discussion and the voting on this ordinance. Thank you, John. Okay, anybody questions? Maybe before questions, Ms. Pratt, is there anything that I missed here since I can't look at my notes? <laughs> I had some specific topics I wanted to cover, but I can't. We did specifically include in section seven um, that staff was directed to investigate further the noise issue. So we staff was directed in section seven to further investigate the noise issue. Okay. Yes, Council Mayor Furtani. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And so to clarify, um, this is an interim regulation, so we're going to be revisiting it um, actually next meeting. At that point, that's going to be the um, 
for lack of a better term, the ordinary resolution that we're going to be passing that will address the noise issue? Or are we not addressing that on the 22nd? So it's a general question. I'm looking for the steps forward we're doing. It will, it will be up to you uh, whether or not you pass a permanent ordinance on June 22nd after the public hearing, or whether you ask for additional you know, amendments to be made to a draft, that's completely up to you. An interim uh, ordinance is valid for six months um, unless you extend it. So the, the state statute doesn't put you under any time constraint to adopt it next week. That's completely up to council what you wanna do as far as timing adopting permanent regulation. Yeah, thanks for the clarification. Yeah. And colleagues on point relative to the schedule, the next steps will be, should this body choose to move forward with this tonight? And I fervently hope we will. Uh, again, it's an interim or ordinance. And as Ms. Pratt said, the, the temporary nature of this is, is the placeholder in there is six months. However, it is my hope that this body will, will whatever, whatever we consider is the final ordinance, which I hope will be constrained to no other changes in the future other than potential language about noise abatement, uh, and potentially if there's anything that comes up in the public hearing that is that is we've somehow missed, uh, which I hope we haven't, that we would move forward with the final uh, uh, permanent ordinance, so to speak, and get out of the temporary zone as quickly as possible. So if we're gonna move this, since it's an emergency, do we have to oh. get rid of the three touch rule? Yes, we do. And Ms. Pratt, can you talk about the um, the nature of passage of this ordinance under the emergency, please, under the state statute? If a majority plus one of council passes the ordinance, it can be effective immediately. If only a majority passes the ordinance, it would be effective in five days. So in effect, it would be five for immediate immediate uh, uh, implementation, uh, immediate effect, excuse me, try to be legally correct. And four, it would go into effect after five days. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I didn't hear whether we have to pass a three touch rule. Uh, we have to pass a, uh, we have to waive the three touch rule before we move this. As part of your government. Okay, so yes. I'm going to uh, move that we waive the three touch rule so we can consider ordinance 23-1270 this evening. Cl Second. Clarification: Does does that automatically do the retaining wall design, or is that separate? Do we have to take the design standards separately from they are, the ordinance? They are referred to, to so in they are a single a single document. document. Thank you. I will second the three touch rule. Okay, it's been moved and second to uh, remove the three touch rule on ordinance number twenty three dash twelve seventy. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Mr. And Mr. Mayor, as the person who moved the three touch rule, if I could just um, make a statement here. Um, I want to really thank the Deputy Mayor and um, our city attorney for working on this and getting the getting this before us. I do think it's the right thing to do. And um, uh, the concerns that I have stated in the past about being careful about staying in our in our lane, I think are all addressed here. And so I'm comfortable with this and I just want everybody to know that. Okay. And yes. uh, I'd like to say also, I appreciate the work on this and I want to note that we have had a lot of public process on this leading to this point. So even though this and, and a public hearing as the deputy mayor said, so even though we have suspended our three touch rules and are proceeding on an emergency basis, there has been a lot of uh, public and uh, uh, other input and uh, consideration by this body. Yes, Council Member Verdi. And thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And to add on to what Council Member Bodie said, um, I'm in favor of this as well. And this is not the last we're going to hear from the public about this. We'll be having that public hearing in the next meeting. And so I look forward to hearing a lot of great input from y'all. Council Member Goldner. Yes, um, I will admit I'm not thrilled that we're doing this via a public emergency. Um, you know, 
but considering the totality of what of the situation, I think it is reasonable, if not ideal. I also think that Ordinance 1270 is substantially similar to what we have been discussing most recently on Monday with the uh, suggestions, most of the suggestions that the council had on Monday. So other than noise, I think we're 90% of the way there. So with that in mind, I will be voting in favor. Councilmember Moreno, I have one. I Working. Yes, yeah, I can have um, notes. I, I appreciate all the effort of uh, um, staff and, and my colleagues in getting us here. It's been um, a heavy lift to get to this document, and it's not done, but I think it is done enough for right now that it, it, it holds to the values of our community outside of the noise. And so I think uh, moving forward with that language and how do we address the, the noise issue, it's going to be important for me. But I think this document is what we need right now is what we can all agree on. We know will work. Um, so I will support uh, this, um, approving this tonight. So after um, oxygen a defibrillator, defibrillator and sending this over to the fire station, my computer is back. There are two points I wanted to make. Um, one is section seven, uh, prior to issuing a decision on the retaining wall, the public works director shall obtain at the applicant's expense. A written structural review and recommendation from an independent third party with professional expertise and no affiliation with the applicant. The other thing, uh, so Ms. Pratt, my understanding is that we're asking the applicant to, to asking staff to look into this topic further than just specifically taking them at their word. Yes. Okay. The other, the other question, uh, other thing comment I wanted to make is that Director Bennett has reported over more than a few meetings that he has been getting information and received a report from PACE on landscaping treatments. Thank you very much, Steve, that we have included in the design standards and this needs to be added to the record as supporting documentation. You will receive, all receive this documentation today in your, um, yes. I guess you, you receive it by email, but I, I mean, maybe paper copies as well, I'm not quite sure. Oh, excellent, there you are. So I just wanna make sure that that's entered in the record. Um, for everyone's clarification. Um, and with that, I'd like to go ahead and move ordinance number 23, uh, 1270, an ordinance of the city council of the city of Lake Forest Park, Washington, adopting interim developments regulations as authorized by the Growth Management Act relating to retaining walls, declaring an emergency, providing for several ability and establishing an effective date. Second. I move the second. No other discussion. All those in favor of ordinance number 231270, please say aye. 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 Nines, unanimously. Actually, there's one sustained, I guess. Abstained. 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 Somebody didn't vote. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Tom. I just want to say a big thanks to to Kim and her staff and, and Mr. Bennett as well. Uh, it was a huge lift in a very, very short period of time. And um, Kim and her staff were incredibly responsive about getting this uh, to us um, as quickly as possible. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, and I neglected to say thank you to Mr. Bennett. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, now we're moving on to the resolution number 23-1902. We have Corey and Jeff, and let's do you guys tell us which way we're going here. Hello. Okay. Um, so I'm here introducing the resolution authorizing the mayor to sign the agreement for consultant services with DCG Watershed for the Lakefront Improvement Design Engineering Environmental Review and Permitting Project. We had three submittals for RFQ, and we thought DCG Watershed was by far the best candidate with their experience, the background, the team they put together, and their proposal. So I'm going to let Amber and Chuck take it their propose their presentation on the scope of work. Thank you. Can you all hear me? I have uh, allergies that are just really oh, yeah. acting up. Okay. Um, so I want to start by thanking the mayor and the council for your consideration this evening especially considering the late hour. We do appreciate it. Um, thank you for this. It's all your fault, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's very clear from the public comment and then from the discussion that this is a, a thoughtful and um, dedicated community. 
who is um, impassioned about about the things that are affecting them. So um, with that, I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Um, so our agenda, this is the, uh, we were asked to give a little bit of an abbreviated reprise of the presentation that we made in the interview. Um, so to start with just introductions, a little bit of a presentation about the team, <clears throat> and then uh, some time for questions and discussion. At the time that we gave this interview, we uh, were responding specifically to the proposal and to the RFQ. And since that time, since the notice of award, we've had subsequent conversations with some city staff working through the scoping exercise. So um, to that extent, we have had some additional feedback uh, that you'll see in the scope. Um, so in terms of that, I'll just go ahead and jump ahead. So I'm Amber McClusick. I'm the Director of Landscape Architecture at DCG Watershed. I'll be the point of contact and project manager on this project. Um, presenting with me today is my colleague, Chuck McDowell. Um, he's a landscape architect as well. He'll be uh, design and contributing to the design and outreach. Um, not with us today, but present at the interview were Jack Chafin, who is a principal architect at Johnston Architects. Um, he has a specialty in adaptive reuse architecture, which we saw as a critical component of this project. Um, as well, not present today, but at the interview was our colleague, uh, Steve Robert. Steve Robert is a, a certified marine and civil engineer with extensive, um, extensive experience in uh, waterfront structures for public recreation and lakefront environments. So a little bit about our team. We have our team essentially structured uh, with multiple disciplines across staff. So on a project this complex, it is important to sort of speak to each of those angles. We have the team arranged with um, our core design and engagement team. That is uh, Jack Chapin for architecture, a uh, colleague of mine, Kyle Braun, and then uh, Chuck and myself who are here today. We also are supported by our core technical team that constitutes the uh, engineering disciplines, civil, structural, and marine, as well uh, environmental permitting and planning, Kenny Booth, uh, extensive experience in uh, City of Lake Forest Park, and then Ryan Kalo, who's an ecologist. He also has experience in, uh, in Lake Forest Park and has worked on, on other projects uh, within this reach of Lion Creek. So in addition on the core technical team, we have Kirk Harris from Transportation Solutions. He's a transportation engineer. We really see transportation as a critical component of this project and have him on that core technical advisory. Um, the team is supported by a bench of technical resources. We know that these resources, were, resources are gonna be critical to multiple stages of this project. Since notice of award, we've structured the scope to really focus on a um, kind of fact-finding design development uh, you know, conceptual design approach for the first phase. So it is entirely possible that we won't engage all of these disciplines. A good example of that is a survey. We know that a survey is going to be necessary for the, um, the limit of work. However, based on the conversations that we've had with the city, our knowledge of the project, what was presented in the RFQ, we understand that that limit of work is somewhat flexible. So there was the discussion as to maybe overflow parking being provided within the city hall parking lot. Um, if we're looking at survey all the way across into the town center, or potentially looking at uh, a much larger survey scope than just the two additionally acquired parcels. So therefore, we don't want to pull the trigger on some of those technical studies until we have an understanding solidly of where the project is. So that step is true as well with things like electrical engineering and geotechnical. Geotechnical borings and investigation are a substantial cost potentially to the project. And we only want to do the extent that is going to be necessary to actually complete the work. So in that sense, that's why we have these uh, technical teams set up as reserves in the scope and here why they're identified as the technical resource team. Cost estimating is a specialty that we have included in the base scope because we understand that a core component of determining what the concept design is going to be is providing the city stakeholders, that's the council and the parks and recreation board and the citizenry of Lake Forest Park with actually informed professionally prepared costs based on you know, a menu of potential, co potential concept design uh, alterations. That would be things like you know, rehabbing the structures in their entirety, rehabbing some, demoing all. There's a lot to unpack here. And so for that reason, cost estimation is concluded as part of the um, this critical first phase. So why us? Uh, DCG Watershed really chose to pursue this project because it speaks squarely to what we do. We work in waterfront and marginal environments, streams, creeks, lakefronts. Um, as a personal passion, we're all... Uh, 
engaged with these environments in our, you know, pastimes and commitments. We chose to go into this work. We chose to build and work for a niche firm that really specializes in not just navigating these, but navigating them well. So clients come to us because we have a sensibility and a responsibility towards not just preserving these environments, but helping to restore them and helping to navigate within the environmental complexity, the regulatory complexity that's present meeting that with a um, an emphasis on environmental equity. So one of the things that really struck us about this project and the reality of this park, you know, the city has really waited for such a long time to acquire additional lakefront. And as it is today, we have individuals who live in the city of Lake Forest Park who, while they can get to the lakefront at the existing Lion Creek Waterfront Preserve Park, that is very specifically signed that it is not a water uh, you know, it's not a water access park. There's not beach swimming. There's not a kayak put in. So unless you live on the lakefront shoreline in Lake Forest Park, if you want to put your kayak in or swim in the lake, you have to leave the city limit. And that really struck us as something that is critically important as to why this is a legacy park, why this is the product of really generational thinking and planning and forethought between the citizens, the council, their staff and their elected body. And so just that alone made us feel like in some ways, everything that we've done up to this point readies us for these projects. Um, what DCG Watershed has worked on literally hundreds of lake shorelines on Lake Forest or on uh, Lake Washington, um, as well as, as many others. So we were asked to focus uh, in the interview on our approach and our vision. So that's what we're gonna jump into. As a project manager and uh, the administrator of the process on this, I'll be giving the approach portion Then I'm gonna turn over to my colleague um, to talk about vision. So this sequence was informed by what was presented in the RFQ. The RFQ is uh, really up to interpretation. It does identify a May 2023 to a December 24 timeline. However, it's not clear as to what the goal is to achieve by December 2024. Are we looking at ribbon cutting at, and the public using the park? Are we looking at a start of construction? Are we looking at a completion of design? And so in that way, we wanted to kind of break this down into what we saw as workable chunks to build momentum, get the citizen re-engaged, and then carry the project forward, but break it into reasonable phases at milestones that would arm the community and arm the um, arm the, the council and PRB to actually have some idea of what the next stage is. So is there fundraising that needs to happen? Are there those additional studies that need to happen? Um, you know, we're looking at this project as being potentially the city's property. We have private property on the other side. One is, you know, a, a, a quasi public private use of the city council. We have adjacent to that, the, um, the you know, street right of way followed by the uh, King County trail right of way in easement. We have the washed out road of state road 522. And then we have the addition potentially of partnership with the town center if the overflow parking or something will be presented there. And that's not even including other interests such as, you know, the tribes who have an interest in this land, the um, WDFW who will get involved if we're doing any in-water work. There are tremendous interests in this project. And so we really need to make sure that when we're moving forward to engage them, we understand what we're engaging them about. So this is why we've structured the scope as such and why we've uh, determined the schedule as we have here being early and then more precise as presented in the project scope. So getting into some of that uh, nuance and complexity about that communication, there's a lot of interests. Everybody cares about this project, the goal of this project, the outcome of this project. And so in that way, we have to kind of uh, parse through the cacophony of voices and to bring some organization to what that communication is gonna look like. So for us as the project team, we understand that the council and the mayor are uh, accountable to the citizens and that ultimately the vested interest in this park belongs to its owners, which is the public. However, when it comes to the, the consultant team and the organization of communication with us, we really have to have an accountability party, which is the staff at liaisons between the city and us. So Lake Forest Park Public Works. Uh, following down from that, we'll go through some exercises on how to bring organization to this. So that can be identifying parties who are responsible, who are going to be advisors or guiders on this project, who are going to be active participants in its design, uh, you know, design development, or who is going to be brought along as a partner, informed along the way, but potentially not making decisions. So 
with the roles defined, um, we can move forward with an active engagement, active effective project process and engagement process. So our typical approach to moving the project forward really moves us from things like site inventory through programming, design refinement, and into implementation. Um, and then there's the parallel engagement process. So how is the public participating through their visioning, their preferred design, do, developing alternatives? What we prefer to do is move these essentially together in lockstep. So by merging these together and moving through them in parallel, we're never getting so far ahead of the public that they feel alienated from the process. We have planned a check with them each stage to make sure that we can respond in real time to the public's attitudes. Oftentimes a project like this, you can get started and then see through to the end. However, there are sometimes times where things go on hold because of funding, because of pandemics, because of construction strikes, and losing that momentum um, is really critical that we keep people focused on the decisions that are already made so that we avoid rework and loss of the city's investment in the process. Mm -hmm. So by doing this, what we can say is that um, we're never going to get so far away from the public that if public attitudes are changing and wanting to push the project in a different direction, that catches us by surprise. So in terms of our design thinking, DCG Watershed, you know, we have a, a regulatory and permitting arm. We have civil engineers who deal with uh, construction standards and rules. Landscape architects were very aware of the codes that regulate our profession and the specific standards that individual communities have to maintain their character in place. We are very specific about navigating within those. So to that end, we rather than looking at, you know, how can we get around what's the big design idea, we come forward and forth with identifying these first, so that the idea that we have is really born out of the design and out of the, the place that it came from. So this design, if we respond to the constraints that affect the place, then the unique design and concept that we come with after that is going to be something that really can't exist anywhere else. It's not about coming with a design and saying, will you buy this? It's about working with the community through a process and then getting to a place where the community feels like they own it. So um, this analysis graphic was something that we shared in our proposal. Um, we identified a handful of things that we really saw as critical key issues in this process. Um, a number of those are, are written on this slide and were discussed in depth in our proposal. Um, Having not gone through an exercise of process with the community, I want to make sure that that caveat is there. This is us getting excited and being asked to think forward because we had to in order to provide a proposal and to be here doing this presentation. However, we're ready to, you know, kind of throw this on the floor of the drafting room and then begin to start anew in a process of ideation with the community. So um, a few questions came up that I think are going to play a major role in the park vision. And one of them for us is the legacy. So this park is well-deserved and needed. As mentioned, it's the product of years of planning and forethought. And so its current condition is complex because of everything that brought it to where it is. But I think one of the things that we need to consider is how are visitors and the public gonna receive the park after it's finished when they have no idea of the backstory. And so in that way, it became important to us to think we have two new acquisition parcels adjacent to an existing park. If you understand that they were once two separate things, it sort of makes sense as to if why development on one doesn't completely respond to development on the other. But as soon as this project is finished and we move forward, the public will see this as one park. It will be one location. And so I think in terms of how these things are programmed together, it provides actually a substantial advantage for us to start to bring the recreational center into the center of this combined parcel and then allow it to have its identity there rather than pushing up against the margins of the private residence or the civic club on the other side. So there's a number of, a handful of things that we really felt like we needed to be thinking about. We're in the now, but then how will the public, the next generation have this park um, as part of their community? And then the second was just the reality of the use and program. So the catalyst for this was expanding public access. And so we really need to think about what is the logistics of public access on the shoreline? Are people arriving with families and swimming? Are they toting kayaks to get there? And how does that happen? And if things like parking are not provided on the site, then what's the way that we can safely get people here so that they can actually enjoy the full program of uses that the property was meant to have? So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chuck um, 
for presentation on the vision. Thank you. Um, my name is Chuck McDowell, landscape architect with DCG Watershed. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, what we called out as our vision in the RFQ. Uh, what it really is, is more of a conversation about our visioning process. So uh, just reiterating one of the points that Amber made that this was done as kind of an exercise to start to ideate what this park can be. So you're gonna see some sketches, you're gonna see some drawings. Um, it's really meant to be kind of a, a, a preview of what our process might look like once we get to work with the community. So our process starts by looking at the, the broader picture, the bigger picture, thinking about where people are coming from, the, the context of the whole city, um, acknowledging that folks from throughout the city are coming to this one spot down on the waterfront to find their access to the water. Um, we also know that users from other communities adjacent are gonna be coming through. So we think through how are they getting there? What are the modes of transportation? How are they um, seeing this site as they arrive? And as we zoom in, you know, one of the things that we acknowledge really early on is that the location of this site is both an incredible opportunity and, and one of its greatest features, but it's also going to provide some real challenges in terms of access and um, safety. And so what we have talked about early on is where does the experience of the park start? Is it right at the, the property line? No, probably not. It might be at City Hall where people are parking to, to come to the park. And so when we start to look at some of these conditions, we, we think about um, that experience really starting um, outside of the project boundary, uh, acknowledging the challenges that are provided. And you see a lot of, a lot of pavement in this, this um, uh, image here and working with our traffic engineer and our consultants to really strategize the right approach for um, accessing the park and thinking about the park as a gateway and where that gateway starts. And as we get to the park um, property boundaries, we start to think about what's the identity of this park? What's the history of the park? Who are the users through time? So that we can really start to think about how do we define an edge for the park versus uh, some of the residential parcels on Beach Drive? How do we provide legibility to that experience? And also thinking about um, that vehicular experience through there, how do we pro provide greater definition around that? And then when we get to the real exciting parts of the project, we think about the core center and waterfront of the park and think about the views, uh, the existing trees, the vegetation, the existing creek mouth, and recognize that it's a very environmentally critical and sensitive area. And it can also be improved for, for both kind of the environmental features and as well as users of the site. So going back to uh, this diagram that Amber uh, explained earlier, we took this and kind of iterated on it and thought through what are the opportunities now that we're starting to get a greater understanding of the site and thinking about what that future might look like. And again, this is just some sketching that our team has done to really think through some of the exciting things, the opportunities, the challenges, um, and start to play with that. But once we start this project with the community, with city staff, start to get our boots on the ground, start to look at surveys and past documents, this is all gonna change um, and it's gonna start all over. And so the way that we've kind of set the framework for looking at uh, some of the um, areas of the park were the entry experience, the interior, the heart of the par park, and then the waterfront. And as we thought about that entry experience, some of the critical points here are thinking about flow of pedestrians, flow of vehicles, flow of bicycles, uh, what that entry experience is in terms of circulation, um, who is circulating through there. So we recognize that the change in uses uh, at this property will likely mean people bringing kayaks, people bringing kids, needing a place to drop off, temporary parking. Um, and at the same time, we're, we're also balancing that against um, the, the existing use of Beach Drive. And so I think thinking about really critically what that looks like so that we're addressing all residents' concerns along there, as well as you know, the new incoming public is, is going to be a, a real um, point of conversation as we dig into this. 
And we visualized a couple of uh, quick sketches. This is uh, looking east on Beach Drive at what that might look like. Um, so again, early ideation of what this could be, um, preserving some of the vegetation, bringing legibility and, and um, signage to the waterfront park, um, and trying to create kind of a clear distinction between what is public and what is private. And looking the other direction here, we're, we're kind of on the, the east end looking back west. And as we get to looking at kind of the, the center of the park or the core, we um, really started to work with Johnston Architects and Jack um, thinking about what the structures might uh, be in the future. And I think there's four or five structures out there now, two that have been kind of discussed as a possibility for adaptive reuse. And so, you know, Jack's team over at Johnston Architects is, is well versed in adaptive reuse. So really kind of honing in what the historic character is, what the opportunity is. Uh, looking past some of the, the grime to see the potential. Um, and, and their group has, has really looked at opportunities like this and had executed on projects that have, have considered what these spaces can become, whether it's um, offices, event space um, of various sizes, uh, art galleries. Um, and we've also discussed some opportunities for uh, bringing in vendors, either full-time or temporary. And, and, you know, the, the opportunities are there for us to, to dig into further. And then on the waterfront side, we recognize again that it's a complicated ecosystem along that edge, a uh, huge opportunity for bringing people to the water. And uh, you know, our DCG watershed team has much experience with um, waterfront parcels, looking at various uh, opportunities for swim docks or uh, kayak docks, um, bringing accessibility to the waterfront is gonna be a, a primary issue that we'll wanna tackle up front. And of course that programming um, process will inform what types of structures we really will end up with in the water. Um, and so just a, a sketch from the waterfront side and, and thinking about various areas that might be integrated on the park and, and bringing people to the water. And I think with that, we're maybe on to questions. Thank you. If you want to step back in. Questions, um, yes. Councilmember Cassower. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you um, for being here tonight. And we're sorry we kept you so late. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I think one of the things that I want to just put out there right away, um, given many discussions in the community over time, is that this could be an opportunity for Lake Forest Park, not just to recognize that we are on lands that were once belong to the Salish Sea people, but that to, to actually tangibly recognize them. And I would hope that in the park, we can do that in a very meaningful way. So I notice you have tribes on your, on your big map there of all the different organizations and groups. And I sort of would like to see them up a little higher than all the way down at the bottom left. So, um, I, I think that's going to be important to people in the community, but, you know, I am thrilled that you have um, this parallel track going where you are consulting with the community as you go each way. But I just wanted to, to raise that issue. Um, and there's history on that lot also from the settlers that came here um, and started and founded Lake Forest Park. So there's both those pieces of history. Deputy Mayor French. I just like to thank you so much for your presentation. Um, really exciting. The uh, I just want to echo uh, Vice Chair Castle's sentiment about the native connection. Uh, one of my favorite parks um, a, over on eastern Washington uh, is in Winthrop. It's called Homestream Park. You can look it up. Um, and it's actually was created by a foundation. But the the native element uh, and celebrating the native culture there is, is extraordinary. It's it's just a, a ma an amazing place done completely by volunteers, which is also even more extraordinary foundation. Um, but uh, I just came this afternoon from touring the new park in Kenmore, and I will not attempt to, to, to pronounce the native um, name, but I have to tell you colleagues, it is, if you haven't seen it, it is extraordinary. I mean, it, I was, my jaw dropped when I went in there and also the celebration of culture. I thought it was really quite, uh, quite amazing. It'd be actually really, fun for us to do a field trip as a group down there because it's it's quite awe-inspiring 
So anyway, uh, just echoing my colleague's sentiments on that. Yes, that's Mayor Bodhi. Yes, thank you very much. And I really appreciate your um, approach and presentation and the fact that you're staying so late tonight. Um, I I don't think we're in a position to vote on this tonight yet. I'm the liaison to the Parks and Recreation Board. And uh, this is really not, um, I think we might want to take a, a uh, some time as a council to look at the elements of the contract uh, and and have some reflection after the presentation from from you and your and your team. So I, I want to say I'm very impressed. it's it's really uh, thoughtful and I really am excited about some of the concepts uh, that you've already come up with. I just want a little more reflection time. One thing I wanted to highlight, I agree with my colleagues about the historical and cultural links, and I, I think the, uh, the Muckleshoot tribe in particular is the tribe that had, had treaty rights and experience in this area. So I would, I would hope they would be excited to partner with us and, uh, and provide input and suggestions. Um, but I wanted to highlight the view of the um, Parks and Recreation Board because they're going to be making recommendations on the different stages of the document. So we have engagement with the general public and the Parks and Recreation Board are both representatives of the general public and part of the outreach to the general public. They wear two hats going in both directions. And so it's, it's going, they're going to be making formal recommendations to us at the various stages of the different documents and so forth. So we have to allow time. It, it won't just be input from staff. It will be input from this group. And that's important because they're part of the community buy-in there and they're emissaries to the larger public. Um, so I, I just wanted to flag that. I saw that there are meetings scheduled with them, but their role is more interactive than perhaps this implies. So uh, I really appreciate that you flagged the, the traffic, the residences and the safety issues, um, you know, uh, and, and also the community space opportunities uh, because we're kind of constrained here. Uh, so uh, those are things that you're looking at already that I thought are gonna be sensitive, but you've already thought about them. So I was really excited by the fact that you've already started thinking about those things. And especially the, the delineating the definition between the residential area and the, and the park area. Um, the one thing I thought about is what about on the water side? There is, there is one homeowner who's gonna be quite affected. So, uh, and uh, and, and uh, so there, I, and I appreciate the fact that you identified also some, the need for some individual outreach. Um, so uh, that there's different layers of that. So really uh, quite impressive, but uh, give us a little bit of time to reflect. Council member Furutani. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, thank you, Ms. McClusak, my president, right, right, and, and Mr. McDowell. Um, really loved your presentation. What a great vision. Um, one of the concerns that I have um, off the bat is um, the uh, Lion Creek Park, which is right next to it, you've identified as, uh, I how we say, non-active use park. Um, the uh, One of the reasons it's that way is um, we're trying to reestablish the Kokanee Run up that creek. And you may be familiar with some of the work that our Lake Forest Park Stewardship through Stream Keepers is doing on that regard. And so the concern that I have is that um, during the development phase and also during the use phase that that be, you know, and I think the mayor will speak to this. One of the values that we have in the city is that we really want to see fish running in our streams again. And that, you know, we would love for this park to be a wonderful resource for the community, but at the same time that there's these biological resources that we have in our community that we'd love to maintain and also enhance if we can through the use of this park. So I didn't know if you had a biologist on staff or had basically on your technical bench, as it were, some people who work on that sort of thing. Yeah, so absolutely. The um, Thank you. Uh, the kind of bench that we have shown in that graphic includes those outside uh, 
consultants, but we have access to the support of the full DCG watershed team. And that does include fisheries biologists. It includes, um, you know, arborists, ecologists, wetland specialists, wetland biologists, uh, and of course the coastal engineer um, who's been working in things like, you know, sediment and shorelines, uh, et cetera. So we have a team of engineers that specializes in streams. And then we also have our fisheries uh, team. So those would absolutely be individuals that we would be working with. Yes, member Hill. Thank you. And thank you very much for your presentation. As a recovering architect, it was really appreciated the graphics. It was really easy to understand. Um, I have just sort of a comment and thought again, uh, recognizing um, where we're sited and the history behind it, both settlers and, and native um, uh, populations, but also the the folks we have now and today and where we're going and we're we're a community that is is vibrant and young and I think you guys recognize that There's, this is an active spot we don't have a lot of very active parks a lot of our parks are conservation and they're they're low activity parks and so this is going to draw a lot of activity and it's going to be a legacy piece and I think one of the pieces that I'm concerned with is similar to my colleague Councilmember Furatani is is protecting the nature of Lion Creek and sort of just understanding that we want to engage it and use it, but we want to maintain it as the quieter, safer place. Um, and so just, you know, kind of seeing how you've sort of addressed that in your initial studies, I can tell that you kind of have caught on to that, uh, that need. Um, I'm not, I haven't delved in way too deep into your um, proposal here, unfortunately, just kind of had a chance to skim it. I don't have, I think, as many concerns as my colleagues. I know uh, that the process is a skeleton process and it, you work through uh, the definition as you, you get better understanding with who you're working with. Um, so I don't have that same concern. I appreciate our parks board. I just wanna make sure that we don't um, uh, conflate them into a parks design board, oh, absolutely. <laughs> right? Absolutely. <laughs> because yeah. we also have our tree board and they're gonna obviously have um, some insight. We have a, a climate action committee, which is gonna be producing some amazing climate action plan, which will I'm sure uh, impact uh, the decision-making process of that particular parcel. So we are a real collaborative community here. And I, I can see um, that uh, DCG Watershed is, is a good group, uh, at least those of you here, uh, to collaborate with. And I appreciate our st uh, staff and administration for doing the hard work and finding somebody who seems to align with our um, values. So thank you. Council Member Goldman. Yeah, thanks for your presentation. Um, it's after 10, so I'll try to be brief. Um, I, I, I like your presentation. It's, I, I can tell you put a lot of effort into it. I look forward to seeing what you come up with. Um, something I would encourage you to do would be to take inspiration from our neighbors. Uh, for instance, the city of Kenmore recently uh, completely overhauled Log Boom Park, which is just a stone's throw from where this site will be. And so taking inspiration from what Kenmore did, how they modernized the park, and those sorts of amenities, which ones might work here, um, I, I'd encourage you to, to include that. Um, to just uh, add the... Uh... Our engineering team, our coastal engineer, was working on Log Boom Park, Park as well. So Steve Robert, the chief person on this team, he was also working on that one. So exciting. Council Mayor Lebo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I am an architect just to help understand where I'm coming from and have been practicing for nearly 30 years. Um, I think we're getting the horse in front of the cart here. Um, I think the vision should grow out of conversations that you have with the citizens of Lake Horse Park. And one of the things I noticed is that um, your cultural resource and archeological services was actually an extra service and not really part of the program. And so I'm concerned that, you know, uh, we may think about historical, but we also have prehistorical. Uh, considerations and that this park should really be a reflection of the vision of the citizens of Lake Forest Park and not necessarily a smaller version of an active park that we may have nearby. When we think about what we want to represent to our children and our grandchildren about our stewardship, there are many that have preceded us who have been great examples of stewards of the land and of the environment. So I don't mean to disparage, but we shouldn't have something that just says, because we don't have an active park, we must have an active park. 
what we need to say is what is the vision that we have in Lake Forest Park that we wish to represent to our citizens as well as to our children and grandchildren. I'm concerned that our vision has gotten in front of what listening to the community is saying to us. I've noticed, for example, that your design charrette um, reflects staff and key individuals as opposed to developing those ideas from listening to our community. I'm concerned that we're moving too quickly into the design solutions and you spoke of trying not to get um, too far in front of our citizens, but this process that you've outlined suggests that we've already gotten too far in front of our citizens. The parking and other street uh, concerns will be a big one because such an active park will already be constrained just by the parking and how we achieve it. The other is that we haven't really considered some of the environmental aspects of what goes on in this in terms of the existing hazardous materials that we already have on the site, which again is not part of your proposal. So I understand the interest and value of not having such technical services such as geotech or survey work, but we miss opportunities when we don't recognize that those things are existing constraints that we may have to deal with. So I'm not supportive of passing this as an action tonight. I would like to take a little more time to consider this proposal and ask the city and the consultant really describe to me not your vision for what the park is, but your vision for how you're going to draw from the citizens of Lake Forks Park and draw from the legacy, not just historic legacy of this environment, but rather recognize the sustainability concerns for the environment that we have as our citizens. There are beaches that we can swim at just because we don't have a beach here for the general public doesn't mean that we should have an active beach here. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I just wanna say as a counterpoint, one of the challenges we have in this community is our two active beaches are private clubs. Exactly, sorry. And I, I, I feel, and I am a member of one sorry. of them. It is my only access to the water is through that membership. And I think we hold a value of equity in this community. And one of the things that is that I struggle with as a leader in this community saying, oh, you wanna to go to the water? We'll go to Kenmore, go to Madison Park. You know, I want them to be able to have a home here on the water and whether that's active or some combination, I just know that in my heart, my community needs to have an equitable, accessible place to the lake, because that is what is missing here. So um, I appreciate the concern. And I think the ideas that you've put forward are, are, are ideas. And, and I know that our community will not be shy in speaking up of what they sure. want. <laughs> so I'm less concerned about they will come and they will they will make their needs me. known. And if it's less active than what they want, that's fine. I have heard from my constituents that they want something that's active and they want access to that water in the way that those that can afford it at the private um, clubs have access. So to me, it's equity. It's, it's, a, it's what we need to do. There you go. There's 12,000 people that don't get to go to the lake and see the view. That needs to be taken care of, okay? So start asking when you're doing this stuff. I don't care about the people live on the lake. I care about the 12,000 people that can't even get near the lake. That's, we're called Lake Forest Park, okay? And so I think there's a real reason. I'm so excited that the city actually stepped up and got a park. I don't want this to take 10 years. So all the kids right now are out of here before they get to see the Mount Rainier and stuff. So I know everybody's ideas are very important, but the citizens are important too. And they have the right to use the lake just like everybody else does. Thank you. Thanks for staying here till 10 o'clock at night. You're probably the, li the latest like thing we've had like this ever, isn't it? You know, if you stay here a little longer, we'll serve you breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to go to the police department. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah, great. You'll be hearing from us. Okay. Thank Jeff, you. you're up. Thank you very much. You don't want us to vote no, we're not. They're not going to vote. They're not. You guys, we're not voting on this, right? We're going to move this. You right. guys want to look at That's this. That's what I was program. suggesting. Yeah. It really is like the first touch on, on substance. Okay. Can you order pizza? Please. <laughs> <laughs> What point of order do we, do we need to do any action like tabling i know that's not the right thing but is there a way that we do well i think you guys just really need to look at everything and see what questions you want to do and we'll have to bring them back and okay. work forward on that all right 
Okay, Jeff, resolution, you have the next page resolutions. <laughs> resolution 23-1892, authoring the mayor signed agreement between the city of Lake Forest Park and Teamsters Local 117, representing maintenance workers. If you would uh, indulge me, I'd like to take uh, B, C, and D all at the same time okay, for discussion. Okay, we're going to do ordinance 23-1267, amending the 2023 budgeted positions and salary schedule incorporated in ordinance number 1256 adopting the 2023-2024 biennial budget and resolution 23-1900 authorizes the mayor to sign the memorandum of understanding between the city of lake forest park and the team birds local union number 117 representing maintenance workers there you go great job mayor <laughs> you great can job. solve it as quick as i can read Say it that <laughs> <sounds fast. laughs> okay well uh tonight we do have um success with our bargaining with the Teamsters. Uh, we started this bargaining process back in the spring of 2021. <laughs> um, uh, negotiate 2021. 2021. I'm just... Yes. Um, point. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> uh, negotiations lasted for two years until the union members voted on March 13th of this year, 2023, and approved the new... Uh, approved approve the new agreement. Uh, the new agreement begins January 1, 2022, and is effective through December 31st, 2024. Um, the three-year three contract includes increases in 2022 of 3% for a wage increase. In 2023, it's a 4% market adjustment and a 3% wage increase. And in 2024, it's a 3% wage increase and 3% market adjustment. Uh, the um, maintenance workers and lay workers were um, uh, out of market by by that percentage, about four, uh, seven percent. Um, the only other financial implication would be the monthly employment, monthly employee, monthly employee premium sharing for the medical benefits in twenty twenty four is capped at one hundred fifty dollars per month. Um, and then again, those were the major sticking points uh, at the end of the day for this agreement was financial. Um, the budget. For 23, for 2023 and 24, has sufficient funding for the salaries and benefits in the new agreement, and that completes the first item on the agenda. Um, and I'll just move on to the second one. Um, that would be the new salary table that we have for uh, the employees. The salary table is included with the new collective bargaining agreement to reflect the adjusted salaries. The salary table um, uh, also includes in the also included in the salary table is an adjustment to the salary for the operations superintendent who supervises the Teamsters. That position was below market rate and the new salary reflects an 8% increase to account for internal equity and compression issues. And finally, uh, attaches the memorandum of understanding that includes Juneteenth as a paid holiday for the Teamsters. Uh, Juneteenth was not negotiated into the new contract. However, it's recognized it as a city holiday and should be afforded to all city employees for consistency and fairness. So those are the three items regarding the Teamsters. Questions? Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> we, we get to start negotiations in six months. Appropriate ones, so do we have to take them separately? Oh, we've got it. Mr. Goldman. Yes. Um, yes, I'd like to move that we suspend the three touch rule with respect to resolution 23 1892, ordinance 23 1267, resolution 23 1900. Second. It's been moved and second to move. Remove the three touch rule on resolution 23, ordinance 23, and resolution 23, 1900. All those, in, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Go ahead, um, I'd like to move resolution 23-1892, authorizing the mayor sign an agreement between the city of Lake Forest Park and Teamsters Local Number 117, representing maintenance workers. And second. Oh, do I do all three? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. And also, point of order, we should vote on them separately. Okay, so do I need a second on resolution 23. Second. Okay. If you vote on them separately, it gives individuals who only want one or two to have the opportunity to right. vote. Yeah. Okay. okay, so it's been moved and second. Any other discussion on resolution 23, 1892? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any nays? Pass unanimously. Thank you, Council. Ordinance 23-1267, amending the 2023 biannual by budgeted positions and salary schedule incorporating 
in ordinance number 1256, adopting the 2023-24 biennial budget. So moved. Secondly, God. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's he been says, moved and seconded. It's been moved and seconded. Any other? Well, you guys are so fast there. I've never experienced this before. <laughs> all right. All those, it's been moved to second ordinance 23 1267. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any nays? Pass unanimously. I should start reading earlier along. Resolution 23 1900 authorized the mayor to sign a memorandum of understanding between the city of Lake Forest Park and Teamsters Local Union 117 representing maintenance workers. So moved. Second. Been moved and second. Any other? No. Nope. Resolution 23. All those in favor of resolution 23 1900, please say aye. 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 Any nays? Pass unanimously. Out of all the people that have worked in the city, you just accomplished yeah. something that nobody else has ever had. I'd like to congratulations. congratulations. Took you two well and a half done. years, but you did it. <laughs> So plus, I see that you've got some part-time workers. Yeah, that's good thing too. Congrats! Yeah. Oh, good. Well, and many thanks to the the team as well. Yeah. yeah. Your Thank you. It was a long haul. Okay. Do we have any other business, no. Council? Oh. <laughs> Thank you. I'll be super quick. Okay. I am the uh, member of RACER for the Principals Assembly. Our first meeting is towards the end of the month. All the other cities also have an alternate. We do not. If you are interested in being an alternate, uh, please reach out to Phil. And maybe then we could vote on it at our June twenty second meeting. Thank you. Does the alternate have to wear the robe too? <laughs> <laughs> I keep expecting you to. to I, mo I make a motion for a pint of ale. <laughs> <laughs> I see that the chief has joined us. I, he probably doesn't know the context. Chief's <laughs> <laughs> doing. Just... Are they still there? Really? Yeah, I might. Mike had a great event for it all the whole entire city. I just police noticed department. that the police department rescued baby ducks. Yes. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, so thank you, Chief. Okay, Council Committee reports. Is that anything? Uh, no. Did I have an important? Okay, uh, Council Member reports. Uh, yes. Yes, I am only going to give you one of the meetings that I've attended. The others one, will go because this one's important. Seashore. Uh, we had that last Friday. And the presentation was by Julie Kim, who is the new new-ish CEO of Sound Transit. Um, so she has a rather refreshing outlook on things compared to some presentations I've heard from in the past. First thing she said is she believes it's critical to build the parking garages so that people can get to light rail and BRT, imagine that. Um, she thinks that uh, Multimodal transportation is very important, should be integrated um, with the uh, entire transit system. We need diversity of all types of um, mobility. She told us that the eyes of the nation are on our project because, or, you know, the whole project of Sound Transit, because advancing it, uh, we're advancing it all at once and so quickly. That remains to be seen. Um, <laughs> She needs, she says that it's very important that we make sure that the system as it is now is clean, safe, and accessible, and that that's not really happening. And she's really made it a priority to work on that. Um, and the escalators and elevators must be fixed. Uh, and that we have to get it right now before we expand the system any further. So I have to tell you, that was extremely refreshing to hear. Um, she talked about how transit has changed over time. Um, nationwide the numbers of riders has has diminished but it is coming back uh she talked a lot about some of the other areas which i really won't go into all you know but i'd, I'd be glad to to talk to you but the i i want to um get to the real nub here when she took questions i let her know that here in lake forest park we have issues and she offered to come here to the council to answer our questions, to, to talk to us and answer our questions. And I told her we would be in touch. And since then, um, Bernard Van de Kamp has written to Phil to say that he knows that she has said she will be is willing to come and that he's gonna help facilitate that um, that time for her to come and speak to us. So many thanks. Yes. 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 I know it was um 
We could she, save her she's some a, money. She's a straight shooter. In fact, she started off the whole meeting by saying, I'm from the East Coast and I'm blunt. And I know sometimes here in the Northwest, that's a little hard for people to take. And so when I, it was time for me to ask a question, I said to her, well, I'm going to be blunt back. So that's how that went. But she was very good. So she's going to come and speak to us. So I wanted, I wanted you all to know that. That's great. Yes, Council Member. Briefly at the uh, North King County Coalition on the Homeless today, we got a report out the um, the King uh, Seattle King County Regional Homeless Authority has approved their five year plan. The sub regional five year plans are going to be uh, refined, and so that was the the content that they felt could vary by sub region. So the North King County East South. So those um, sub-regional plans are targeted to be presented to the sub-regions this fall uh, with agreement on them and approval of them by the end of the year. So I know that we've had some concerns here is what is some of the issues that relate to us here. So that will be targeted after summer. We will have those conversations with them after summer. Cool. Yes. Just real quickly. Um... I attended the Sound Cities Association Deputy Mayor's meeting, um, and I have to say, what a what a really dynamic uh, and and fascinating group of people. They're really supportive and and um, uh, really interesting to uh, to work with. Um, I just wanted to mention that you may have read in the papers that there is some turmoil at the cities of Sammamish as well as the city of Redmond. Uh, I will not go into any further detail, but. Um, I just want to say thank you to all of you who sit up here, Mr. Mayor, that we have a very congenial uh, civil dialogue amongst uh, this body, and um, you really recognize the value of it when you hear what's going on in some other, other cities right now, and I, my heart goes out to those cities because some of those folks are really struggling right now in terms of the policymaking side of things. Um, and anyway, so I just wanted to say uh, thank you all. Anybody else? Um, just a couple things. I know if you don't know, we had an armed robbery at the Chevron station yeah. last week. It's really, it's 300 yards from my house. That really bothered me. But um, Seattle's diminishing quite quickly. Um, and now they, the city council decided they're not going to do anything with the Blake ruling. So they're, it's open market up there for drugs. I'm very proud of our police department. I went to an event they had today then Right now, you're being, well, probably we got Lake Forest Park, but the, during our meeting, we were told by the Basel Police Department, because our guys, were all, every single person was up there, but I was very impressed. I go into that place quite a bit, and I am, they told me the poor kid who got robbed, but it's his second, second day on the job. And he was really shaken up, and they, the owner over there was really impressed that one of our officers actually gave the kid a really big hug and helped out a lot mm -hmm. and um, that means more than anything it's really nice to know that we have the officers we do um the chief we do and um they got their work cut out guys we got to keep Lake Forest mm -hmm. Park the way it is and we want people to go to bed safe and we are very fortunate yeah. to have them so as far as that goes when you see the officers or the public work guys they do a great job too thank them because they all do good um yeah. I don't think there is a Phil will be uh, gone for a week or so Thank you, Kim. I, Lindsay, you did a great job tonight. <laughs> so, she talks too much. Yeah, yeah. That's why I said she did a great job. So, yeah. you guys go home. I got to get up in seven hours, six hours. So, right. Oh, I think my feet are asleep. Wait, sweet, sweet, sweet. 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 sweet.